All right, is the simulcast going? All right, we will <clears throat> go on the record on this matter, case CR 22-211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. This is the time scheduled for jury trial. The court would note the prosecution is here as well as the defense and the defendant. We'll do more formal introductions here in a moment. The court would note a couple of things. I think the parties have already been advised as well as all those in attendance. There are some conduct orders that are in effect, both governing conduct within the building, pursuant to an administrative order of Administrative District Judge Hippler, as well as a courtroom conduct order that I've issued for both this courtroom 400, as well as the locations where the simulcast is taking place here in Ada County, as well as in Madison County. Importantly, in this courtroom, courtroom 400, I wanted to reemphasize that uh, no reentry is allowed if you leave during the proceedings. There will be scheduled breaks in the morning and the afternoon and a lunch break. Uh, but if for some reason you need to leave while the case is going, uh, then likely you will not be permitted to return to your seat. And secondly, uh, and I will note that in those other simulcast locations, that is not the case. So parties or can come and go from those rooms or observers. On the electronic devices, uh, no electronic devices are allowed in these proceedings and any of the locations I just mentioned to record, photograph, or transmit any sounds or images while this trial is going. So uh, there is, a, of course, a record being kept every day through the administrative process of the courts, and that will contain the court's audio for purposes of the record of the case. At this point, I'll just briefly inquire, is the state ready to proceed at this time and have the jury brought in? Yes, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Ms. Blake. Is the defense ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Archibald. At this point, then, uh, Mr. Bailiff, could you please bring the jurors in? Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Thank you, and please be seated. All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Uh, first off, apologies for holding you so long in the jury room there. We had a very serious technical issue that arose this morning that delayed the proceedings from starting for a bit. Uh, however, we very much appreciate you all reporting in on time today. I'll note on the record also for the purposes of counsel to know 
that each one of the jurors signed their affirmation that they were provided with when they left for the weekend last week. So uh, with that, I'll begin with a uh, roll call and welcome of the case. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming this morning. You have been seated as jurors in the case now before us. Uh, my name is Stephen W. Boyce, and I'm the district judge for Fremont County, and I'm in charge of the courtroom in this trial. The court clerk is Shannon Holstein, who's seated to my right, and she keeps minutes of these trial proceedings. She'll mark the trial exhibits and administer oaths to you as jurors and to the witnesses. The bailiffs here, deputies Ravello, Beish, and Holmes, are assisting me in maintaining courtroom order and working with the jury. Our court reporter is Patty Bath, who is seated down below me, and she's taking a stenographic record of everything said during these trial proceedings. Courtney Stallings is my staff attorney, seated over by the window to my right, and she will be assisting me from time to time with legal issues that may arise in the case. The call to jury duty is a high and noble calling. As Thomas Jefferson once said, trial by jury is the anchor of all liberties. Therefore, no one should avoid fulfilling this obligation except under the most pressing circumstances. This call upon your time does not frequently come to you, but it is an important obligation of your citizenship in this state and country. Service on a jury is a civic and patriotic obligation that all good citizens should perform. Service on a jury affords you an opportunity to be part of the judicial process by which the legal affairs and liberties of fellow citizens are determined and protected under our form of government. You have been asked to perform one of the most challenging duties of citizenship, that is to sit in judgment on facts that will determine the guilt or innocent, the innocence of the persons involved. For many of you, unless you have served or will serve in the armed forces of our nation, this may be the highest duty of citizenship you will ever perform. Each one of you has been qualified, examined, and selected to serve as a juror of this court. The clerk will now call the roll of the jury. Madam Clerk. Juror number one. Here. Juror number two. Here. Juror number three. Juror number four. <coughs> juror number five. Here. Juror number six. Here. Juror number seven. Here. Juror number eight. Here. Juror number nine. Here. Juror number ten. Here. Juror number eleven. Here. <coughs> juror number twelve. All right, thank you, Madam Clerk. The court will note that the jurors are all present and properly seated. This case has been brought by the state of Idaho. I'll sometimes refer to the state as the prosecution. The state is represented at this trial by Lindsay Blake, if you'd please stand, is the prosecutor for Fremont County. Rob Wood is the prosecutor for Madison County. Thank you. And Rachel Smith is a special appointed deputy prosecutor assisting in this case. The defendant, Lori Noreen Vallow, is represented by her attorney, Jim Archibald, and her attorney, John Thomas. Thank you, counsel. This case is a criminal matter, which means the defendant is charged by the state of Idaho with a violation of the law. I'll now provide you with a brief summary of the indictment, which sets forth the charges against the defendant. The indictment is not to be considered as evidence. It is a, merely a formal description of the charges against the defendant. You must not consider it as evidence of guilt, and you must not be influenced by the fact that a charge has been filed. With regard to the defendant, the state of Idaho alleges that Lori Noreen Vallow committed the crimes of count one, conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft by deception. Count two, first degree murder. Count three, conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft by deception. Count four, first degree murder. Count five, conspiracy to commit first degree murder. Count seven, grand theft. The defendant has pled not guilty to all of the charges. Please remember this is simply a description of charges. It is not evidence. Under our law and system of justice, every defendant is presumed to be innocent. This means two things. First, the state has the burden of proving the defendant guilty. The state has that burden throughout the trial. The defendant is never required to prove her innocence, nor does the defendant ever have to produce any evidence at all. 
Second, the state must prove the alleged crime beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible or imaginary doubt. It is a doubt based on reason and common sense. It may arise from a careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence or from lack of evidence. If after considering all the evidence, you have a reasonable doubt about the defendant's guilt, you must find the defendant not guilty. The duty of the jury is to determine the facts and then apply the law set forth in the instructions I will later give you to those facts. In this way, you will decide the case. In applying the court's instructions as to the controlling law, you must follow those instructions regardless of your opinion of what the law is or what the law should be or what any lawyer may state the law to be. During the course of this trial, including uh, the jury selection process, you've been instructed that you are not to discuss this case amongst yourselves with anyone else, including the use of email, text messaging, tweeting, blogging, electronic bulletin boards, or any other form of communication, electronic or otherwise. Do not conduct any personal investigation or look up any information from any source, including the internet. Do not form an opinion as to the merits of the case until after the case has been submitted to you for your determination. At this time, then, I will have Madam Clerk please uh, swear the jurors under oath. Brian Sanders, Jeff Sanders, Jeff Thank you. Please be seated. Court will note on the record all jurors properly received the oath. I'll next discuss our trial procedures with you. Uh, in terms of the hours we're going to be running, typically we'll be starting at 8.30 each day and going through trial until 3.30 with a lunch break. We'll try to keep the lunch break at under an hour uh, in order to provide you some time uh, after trial each day to attend to your personal affairs. We'll generally be having a mid-morning break for 10 to 15 minutes and a break also in the afternoon after lunch. If you need any special accommodations, please contact the bailiffs and we'll let the jury commissioner know that as well. During the trial, your seating where you now are, you will remain seated in those same assigned seats throughout the duration of the trial. That consistent seating helps the court and counsel become familiar with you as jurors and become readily aware if a certain juror is not present. Um, I appreciate everyone being punctual today. Please continue to do that and we'll do our best to be punctual as well and get things started on time so we can end on time each day. If you do have any situation preventing you from appearing on time, please immediately contact the courts in the morning and advise us of what's happening and we'll assist any way we can. At times, this trial may be interrupted or delayed due to the necessity of the court or counsel to attend to other unexpected matters. These interruptions and delays are generally short in duration and every effort is made to resume the trial quickly. During short delays, you'll be required to stay in the courthouse and the bailiff will escort you to the jury room. If the delay appears to require a longer amount of time, you may be dismissed for the day with instructions of when you would need to, with instructions of when you would be required to return. Uh, as you're probably now aware, having been here multiple days, we do have restrooms available here for your convenience. If any of you have any special needs during your jury service, please communicate that to the bailiff and we will do our best to take care of that. Uh, the compensation set by Idaho statute, Idaho Code 2-215, $10 per day. We always admonish people, don't spend that whole $10 all at once in one place. So that's your service. <laughs> payment. <clears throat> in regards to your cell phones, uh, you're permitted to have those here with you, but please don't uh, refer or look to those while the court is in session. If you need to use them during breaks, you're permitted to do that with all the other instructions and admonishments you've been given, and please plan accordingly uh, for that. Also from time to time during the trial, uh, you may see me looking at my computer um, and that's generally looking at information on the case or perhaps communicating with other court personnel. So at this time the court will 
now provide its preliminary instructions, and after that, we'll have opening statements. Jury instruction number one. Now that you have been sworn as jurors to try this case, I want to go over with you what will be happening. I'll describe how the trial will be conducted and what we'll be doing. At the end of the trial, I'll give you more detailed guidance on how you are to reach your decision. Because the state has the burden of proof, it goes first. After the state's opening statement, the defense may make an opening statement or may wait until the state has presented its case. The state will offer evidence that it says will support the charges against the defendant. The defense may then present evidence but is not required to do so. If the defense does present evidence, the state may then present rebuttal evidence. This is evidence offered to answer the defense's evidence. After you have heard all the evidence, I will give you additional instructions on the law. After you have heard the instructions, the state and the defense will each be given time for closing arguments. In their closing arguments, they will summarize the evidence to help you understand how it relates to the law. Just as the opening statements are not evidence, neither are the closing arguments. After the closing arguments, you will then leave the courtroom together to make your decision. During your deliberations, you will have my instructions, the exhibit submitted into evidence, and any notes taken by you in court. Instruction number two. The defendant is charged by the state of Idaho with a violation of law. The charges against the defendant are contained in the indictment. The indictment is simply a description of the charge. It is not evidence. Jury instruction number three. It is alleged that the crimes charged were committed on or about or on or between a certain date. If you find a crime was committed, the proof need not show that it was committed on that precise date. Jury instruction number four. Under our law and system of justice, the defendant is presumed to be innocent. The presumption of innocence means two things. First, the state has the burden of proving the defendant guilty. The state has that burden throughout the trial. The defendant is never required to prove her innocence, nor does the defendant ever have to produce any evidence at all. Second, the state must prove the alleged crime beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible or imaginary doubt. It is a doubt based on reason and common sense. It may arise from a careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence or from lack of evidence. If after considering all the evidence you have a reasonable doubt about the defendant's guilt, you must find the defendant not guilty. Jury instruction number five. A defendant in a criminal trial has a constitutional right not to be compelled to testify. The decision whether to testify is left to the defendant acting with the advice and assistance of the defendant's lawyers. You must not draw any inference of guilt from the fact that the defendant may not testify, nor should this fact be discussed by you or enter into your deliberations in any way. Jury instruction number six. If during the trial I may say or do anything which suggests to you that I am inclined to favor the claims or positions of any party, you will not permit yourself to be influenced by any such suggestion. I will not express nor intend to express, nor will I intend to intimate, any opinion as to which witnesses are or are not worthy of belief, what facts are or are not established, or what inferences should be drawn from the evidence. If any expression of mine seems to indicate an opinion relating to any of these matters, I will instruct you to disregard it. Jury instruction number seven. Your duties are to determine the facts, apply the law set forth in my instructions to those facts, and in this way to decide the case. In so doing, you must follow my instructions regardless of your own opinion of what the law is or should be or what either side may state the law to be. You must consider them as a whole, not picking out one and disregarding others. The order in which the instructions are given has no significance as to their relative importance. The law requires that your decision be made solely upon the evidence before you. Neither sympathy nor prejudice should influence you in your deliberations. Faithful performance by you of these duties is vital to the administration of justice. In determining the facts, you may consider only the evidence admitted in this trial. This evidence consists of the testimony of the witnesses, the exhibits offered and received, and any stipulated or admitted facts. The production of evidence in court is governed by rules of law. 
At times during the trial, an objection may be made to a question asked a witness or to a witness's answer or to an exhibit. This simply means I am being asked to decide a particular rule of law. Arguments on the admissibility of evidence are designed to aid the court and are not to be considered by you nor affect your deliberations. If I sustain an objection to a question or to an exhibit, the witness may not answer the question or the exhibit may not be considered. Do not attempt to guess what the answer might have been or what the exhibit might have shown. Similarly, if I tell you not to consider a particular statement or exhibit, you should put it out of your mind and should not refer to it or rely on it in your later deliberations. During the trial, I may have to talk with the parties about the rules of law which should apply in this case. Sometimes we talk over at the side with that white noise device that prevents others from hearing. Other times, you'll be excused from the courtroom so we can have you be more comfortable while we work out those legal issues. You are not to speculate about any such discussions. They are necessary from time to time and help the trial run smoothly. Some of you have probably heard the terms, quote, circumstantial evidence, end quote, direct evidence, end quote, and, quote, hearsay evidence, end quote. Do not be concerned with these terms. You are to consider all the evidence admitted in this trial. However, the law does not require you to believe all the evidence. As the sole judges of the facts, you must determine what evidence you believe and what weight you attach to it. There is no magical formula by which one may evaluate testimony. You bring with you to this courtroom all of the experience and background of your lives. In your everyday affairs, you determine for yourselves whom you believe, what you believe, and how much weight you attach to what you are told. The same considerations that you use in your everyday dealings in making these decisions are the considerations which you should apply in your deliberations. In deciding what you believe, do not make your decision simply because more witnesses may have testified one way than the other. Your role is to think about the testimony of each witness you have heard and decide how much you believe of what the witness had to say. A witness who has special knowledge in a particular matter may give an opinion on that matter. In determining the weight to be given such opinion, you should consider the qualifications and credibility of the witness and reasons given for the opinion. You are not bound by such opinion. Give it the weight, if any, to which you deem it entitled. Jury instruction number eight. Do not concern yourself with the subject of penalty or punishment. That subject must not in any way affect your verdict. If you find the defendant guilty, it will be my duty to determine the appropriate penalty or punishment. Jury instruction number nine. If you wish, you may take notes to help you remember what witnesses said. If you do take notes, please keep them to yourself until after you and your fellow jurors go to the jury room to decide the case. You should not let note taking distract you so that you do not hear other answers by witnesses. When you leave at night, you'll be asked to leave your notes in the jury room. If you do take notes, you should rely on your own memory of what was said and not be overly influenced by the notes of other jurors. In addition, you cannot assign to one person the duty of taking notes for all of you. Finally, jury instruction number ten. It is important that as jurors and officers of this court, you obey the following instructions at any time you leave the jury box, whether it be for recesses of the court during the day or when you leave the courtroom to go home at night. First, do not talk about the case either among yourselves or with anyone else during the course of the trial. You should keep an open mind throughout the trial and not form or express any opinion about the case. You should only reach your decision after you have heard all the evidence, after you've heard my final instructions, and after the final arguments. You may discuss this case with the other members of the jury only after it is submitted to you for your decision. All such discussions should take place in the jury room. Second, do not let any person talk to you about the case in your presence. If anyone does talk about it, tell them you're a juror in the case. If they won't stop talking, report that to the bailiff as soon as you're able to do so. You should not tell any of your fellow jurors about what has happened. Third, during this trial, do not talk with any of the parties, their lawyers, or any witnesses. 
By this I mean not only do not talk about the case, but do not talk at all, even to pass the time of day. In no other way can all parties be assured of the fairness to which they are entitled and to expect from you as jurors. Fourth, during this trial do not make any investigation of this case or inquiry outside the courtroom on your own. Do not go to any place mentioned in the testimony without an explicit order from me to do so. Don't consult any books, dictionaries, encyclopedias, or any other source of information unless I specifically authorize you to do so. And fifth, do not read about the case in newspapers. Do not listen to radio or television broadcasts about the trial. You must base your verdict solely on what is presented in court and not upon any newspaper, radio, television, or other account of what may have happened. Each day you will be required to sign an affidavit affirming that you have followed this admonition. All right, at this time, the clerk will read the indictment and state the defendant's plea. Madam Clerk. If you don't mind, thank you. In the District Court of the 7th Judicial District of the State of Idaho, in and for the County of Fremont, the State of Idaho Plaintiff v. Lori Noreen Vallow, a.k.a. Lori Noreen Daybell, Defendant. Case number CR 22211624. Indictment. Lori Noreen Vallow is accused by the Grand Jury of Fremont County by this indictment as follows. Count 1. Conspiracy to commit first-degree murder and grand theft by deception. The defendants, Chad Guy Daybell, Lori Noreen Vallow, and Alex Cox, deceased, and other co-conspirators, both known and unknown, on or between the dates of October 26, 2018, and continuing until January 15, 2020, in the County of Madison, State of Idaho, and elsewhere, including Fremont County, Idaho, and as part of a continuing criminal transaction and common scheme or plan in Madison and Fremont Counties, Idaho, did willfully, excuse me, did willfully and knowingly combine, conspire, confederate, and agree to commit murder in the first degree of Tylee Ryan and to commit grand theft by deception. Count 2. First-degree murder. The defendant, Lori Noreen Vallow, on or between the 8th and 9th day of September, 2019, in the County of Madison, State of Idaho, and as part of a common scheme or plan or continuing criminal transaction between Madison and Fremont Counties in Idaho, were concerned in the commission of a first-degree murder and did aid and abet in its commission or, not being present, advised and encouraged its commission or, by command, compelled another to commit the crime and did so with malice of forethought and did so willfully, deliberately, and with premeditation, which resulted in the death of a human being, to wit, did either kill Tylee Ryan and or assist in the killing of Tylee Ryan and or did encourage the killing of Tylee Ryan and or did command another to kill Tylee Ryan in violation of Idaho Code Sections 18-4001, sub A. Count 3. Conspiracy to commit first-degree murder and grand theft by deception. The defendants, Chad Guy Daybell, Lori Noreen Vallow, and Alex Cox, deceased, and other co-conspirators, both known and unknown, on or between the dates of October 26, 2018, and continuing until January 15, 2020, in the County of Madison, State of Idaho, and elsewhere, 
including Fremont County, Idaho, and as part of a continuing criminal transaction and common scheme or plan in Madison and Fremont counties, Idaho, did willfully and knowingly combine, conspire, confederate, and agree to commit murder in the first degree of Joshua Jackson Vallow, here and after J.J. Vallow, and to commit grand theft by deception. Count four, first degree murder. The defendant, Lori Noreen Vallow, on or between the 22nd and 23rd day of September 2019 in the county of Madison, state of Idaho, and as part of a common scheme or plan or continuing criminal transaction between Madison and Fremont counties in Idaho, was concerned in the commission of first degree murder and did aid and abet in its commission or not being present, advised and encouraged its commission or by command, compelled another to commit the crime and did so with malice aforethought and did so willfully, deliberately, and with premeditation, which resulted in the death of a human being, to wit, did either kill J.J. Vallow and or assist in the killing of J.J. Vallow and or did encourage the killing of J.J. Vallow and or did command another to kill J.J. Vallow in violation of Idaho Code Sections 184001, 18204 and 184003 sub A. Count five, conspiracy to commit first degree murder. That the defendants, Chad Guy Daybell, Lori Noreen Vallow, and Alex Cox deceased on or about October 1st, 2018 through October, or excuse me, through January 15th, 2020 in the County of Fremont, State of Idaho, and elsewhere, including Madison County, and as part of a continuing transaction and common scheme or plan in Fremont County's Idaho, did willfully and knowingly combine, conspire, confederate, and agree to commit murder in the first degree of Tamara Tammy Daybell, did combine or conspire to commit murder, and one or more of such persons did an act to affect the object of the combination or conspiracy. Count seven, grand theft that the defendant, Lori Noreen Vallow, on or between the dates of October 1, 2019 and January 22, 2020, in the County of Madison, State of Idaho, did, as a common scheme or plan, or continuing criminal transaction between Madison and Fremont Counties, Idaho, by deceit and with the intent to deprive another of property, or to appropriate the same to herself or to a third person, wrongfully take, obtain, or withhold, or aid and abet another to take, obtain, or withhold the property of another, to wit, Social Security survivor benefits allocated for Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow, and Social Security child in care benefits allocated for Lori Noreen Vallow in an amount exceeding $1,000, which said funds Lori Noreen Vallow was not entitled and which did belong to the government of the United States of America. This is signed as a true bill this 24th day of May, 2021. Deputy Presiding Grand Juror, Acting Presiding Grand Juror, Fremont County, State of Idaho. To these charges, the defendant has entered a plea of not guilty. All right, thank you, Madam Clerk, for reading the indictment. Again, I'll remind the jurors, the indictment is simply a description of the charges. It is not evidence. So at this point then, this will be the time for the opening statements. Ms. Blake, I understand that you will be making opening statements on behalf of the state, is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. All right, are you ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. All right, Ms. Blake, then you can commence with your opening statement. Thank you. Money, power, and sex. That's what this case is about. The defendant, Lori Vallow Daybell, used money, power, and sex, or the promise of those things, to get what she wanted. 
What she wanted was money, power, and sex. It didn't matter what obstacle she had to remove to get what she wanted. It didn't matter if the obstacle was a thing or a person. And if it was a person, it didn't matter who. Tylee Ryan was a vibrant young woman, 17 years old, a whole life ahead of her. She was just about to enter into adulthood and make her own way in the world. Who knows what she would have become. Tylee had already lost her father and she received social security benefits because of that. Tylee had money, Lori wanted it, Tylee's gone. Joshua Jackson Vallow, lovingly known by friends and family as JJ, was a seven-year-old vibrant, happy-go-lucky little boy. He had most of his childhood and his whole life ahead of him. But JJ was, was tough, he's, he's a seven-year-old. He took a lot of time and effort and energy to care for. That time, effort, and energy took away from the defendant doing what she wanted to do and from the defendant being with Chad Daybell and devoting her time and attention to him. JJ had also lost his father. And when JJ lost his father, he became even that much more difficult to care for, no longer a second parent to help. Not only that, JJ also was entitled to Social Security benefits. The defendant didn't want to have to take care of JJ anymore. She wanted the money. JJ's gone. Tamara Douglas Daybell, known by friends and family as Tammy, a 49-year-old mother of five, a grandmother, a computer whiz by all accounts. She was married to Chad Daybell. The defendant wanted Chad all to herself. Chad was the beneficiary of a life insurance policy for Tammy. Lori wanted those things. Tammy's gone. <clears throat> Tylee was last seen on September 8th of 2019. She had just relocated with her mother to Rexburg, Idaho on or about September 1st of 2019. And seven days later is the last sighting, known sighting of Tylee. The next time Tylee is seen is on June 9th of 2020. She's found buried in a shallow grave on Chad Daybell's property. And when I say she's found, what I mean is what was left of Tylee was found. Charred remains. That's what was left of Tylee. You will hear it described as a mass of bone and tissue. That's what was left of this beautiful young woman, the defendant's daughter. You will also hear how Tylee's DNA was recovered on a pick, pickaxe and shovel <coughs> located in a shed on defendant Daybell's property. JJ was last seen on September 22nd of 2019 at the defendant's apartment in Rexburg, Idaho. Last time JJ was seen, he was with his uncle, Alex Cox, the defendant's brother. You'll hear from a witness that he saw Alex Cox carrying JJ. JJ's head on his shoulder appeared to be a peaceful scene. It appeared JJ was sleeping at that time. JJ was not seen again until June 9th of 2020, when he was also found in a shallow grave on the defendant's property. JJ was found wrapped in garbage bags with duct tape around him. He had duct tape around his head. He had duct tape around his arms, taping them into a position like this. That's how the defendant's little boy was found. You will hear what a difficult scene that was to process. Law enforcement had been searching for these children since November of 2019. And even the most veteran law enforcement officers you'll hear from were disturbed by the scene. Some may have still been holding out hope against all odds that we'd find these children alive, but this wasn't what they expected to find. Tammy was last seen alive on the night of October 18th 
of 2019. Her son left to work. She was home alone with Chad Daybell on that night. On the morning of October 19th, just before 6 a.m., a 911 call is placed. Tammy's dead. She's cold and she's stiff. What we know is by the time law enforcement showed up, Chad Daybell had moved her body. Chad Daybell gives a description that Tammy wasn't feeling well, she'd been sick. Very few other witnesses report any concerns about Tammy's health. And mind you, at the time law enforcement show up at Tammy's death, when it's been reported, it's unknown at that time about JJ and Tylee missing. It's unknown that Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell are in any kind of a relationship. So nothing about Tammy's death is initially deemed to be suspicious. You will hear that the defendant was in Hawaii at the time Tammy died. And you will also hear that less than three weeks later, 17 days to be exact, the defendant and Chad Daybell were back in Hawaii. They were getting married on a sunny beach in Hawaii, dancing and celebrating their life together, while Tylee and JJ were cold in the ground in shallow graves, and while Tammy had just barely been laid to rest in the Springville, Utah Cemetery, her hometown. The missing children, the sudden death of Tammy, the quick marriage of Chad and the defendant left so many questions for those still grieving the loss of Tammy and those still wondering 24-7 about the whereabouts and safety of the children. You will also hear how the defendant had switched Tylee's money from Tylee's J.P. Morgan Chase account to go into the defendant's BBVA account on or about August 16th of 2019. Tylee went missing on September 8th of 2019. You will also hear how she had begun receiving benefits on JJ's behalf approximately a month before he was last seen. And you will hear how she continued to collect those benefits and that money to fund her lifestyle. You are going to hear a lot of different dates and events that occurred on those dates, phone calls that were placed on those dates, messages that were sent, financial transactions that occurred. The reason you're going to hear about so many dates and so many events is because I've talked about dates in 2019 and 2020. This case actually starts in October of 2018. In October of 2018, the defendant met Chad Daybell for the first time. You'll hear that she had read his books. She was a fan of his. But she traveled to a Preparing the People conference in St. George, Utah. She traveled there with her friends, Melanie Gibb and Sulema Pastenis. These are two women that you will hear more about and you will hear from them during this trial. When she traveled there with them, she met Chad for the first time. You'll hear it described that there appeared to be some kind of an instant connection. The two of them talked a lot. The defendant was flirty. But what you will also hear is that during this first meeting, the defendant and Chad decide that they share purported religious beliefs and that they share beliefs that the two of them had been here, had been married before in a prior probation. You will hear it talked about multi-creations or a prior probation or a prior life. But regardless of the term used, what they began to tell others is that they were essentially meant to be together. They'd been married in prior lives, prior probations. Not only that, but they both said that they had been prior figures from or persons from the Bible or other religious references. This will include that they designated themselves as James and Elena. And you will hear that they pursued this line of thought and they pursued these teachings to others to the extent that Chad Daybell wrote a story, the James and Elena story for Lori, for the defendant. And you will hear through testimony how that story mirrored some true life events that were going on 
between the defendant and Chad Daybell. And at the time they met, it's important to remember, they were both married to other people. Their spouses were both alive and well when they first met. But again, remember, the defendant will remove any obstacle in her way to get what she wants. And she wanted Chad Daybell. She had decided that. Soon after that first meeting in October of 2018, you will hear how the defendants began communicating regularly. Their relationship moved quickly. You will hear how Chad traveled to Arizona that next month in November of 2018. He traveled for a conference, but the defendant also held a gathering at her house and Chad Daybell was present. You will hear how shortly after, the defendant, with the help of Chad Daybell, began telling people and, and purporting religious beliefs and teaching people about a rating system of light and dark. The defendant told others that, with the help of Chad, she could rate people as light or dark. And pretty soon, this theory evolved and these teachings evolved. And they started to say, well, if somebody's dark, an evil spirit or an evil entity can come in and they can push the real person out and take over the body. And the defendant and Chad Daybell talked about how you would get rid of these evil spirits. So the first thing they did was the defendant would lead castings. And you'll hear the castings described a little different by different witnesses, but with the idea being that there was prayer and energy work. They wouldn't have to be near the person that they were casting on, but they would get together and pray or do energy work to get rid of this evil spirit. You will also hear that these castings, time and time again, didn't work. But you'll hear that these teachings evolved. And they evolved to, well, a person could be so dark or a spirit could be so evil that the person actually becomes a zombie. You can't cast a zombie out. But a common theme was the body had to be destroyed. The defendant and Chad used their self-proclaimed religious beliefs and teachings to justify their actions to others. Their actions from an affair to murder. This was especially true with regards to the defendant's brother, Alex Cox. You will hear how Alex and the defendant had an extremely close relationship. Alex would do anything for Lori. And you'll hear how when Alex would do anything for Lori, when she uprooted her life in Arizona on or about September 1st of 2019 and moved up to Idaho and moved to Rexburg to be closer to Chad, that Alex quit his job and moved up to Rexburg with her. If Chad and Lori ask it, Alex did it. You will also hear how Alex Cox was taught by both the defendant and Chad Daybell that his purpose in this probation or this life or this creation, whichever term they use, was to protect Lori. He was a warrior and he was here to protect Lori. When the defendant would talk about people being light and dark, she talked about her own daughter, Tylee, being dark. She told people this, and there's messages that she sent regarding this. But what you won't hear is anything about the defendant doing anything when Tylee went missing. There were no known actions taken by the defendant. No report to law enforcement, no missing person posters, no inquiries. Similarly with JJ, little seven-year-old boy. The defendant said he was dark. He was possessed. She told people this. There's messages about it. But again, what you won't hear is that when JJ went missing, that the defendant did anything. There are no known actions by the defendant to find JJ. 
No report to law enforcement. No missing person posters. No inquiries. You will hear how she described JJ's behaviors to others in an attempt to get them to agree that he must not be JJ anymore, that an evil spirit must have taken over his body. And you will hear how she was very convincing. You'll hear from witnesses how they believed what Lori told them. She was likable, energetic, and they believed her. They wanted to believe her. They wanted to follow Lori. They wanted what she was saying to be true. You will also hear how she told a friend of hers named April Raymond, who's another woman that you will hear from, that when she got divorced, that JJ would need to go live with Charles, his father, and that Charles would have to figure out what to do with him. And part of why she talked about this was that the defendant was also telling people that she was here on a mission. She was here on a religious mission to gather the 144,000. So she needed to spend her time and energy there. So JJ could go live with Charles because she had other things to do. She had more important things to do than care for her child. She expressed to people that what she did here on earth no longer counted for her. You'll hear how she'd hit her hand. Doesn't count for me. Doesn't count for me. She explained this to others by telling them that she was a translated being, and you'll hear more about that and what they taught with regards to that. But she convinced others that they were also in the translation process. Again, she's very convincing. People wanted to believe her. People trusted her. But what it really was was she and Chad using their proposed religious beliefs and teachings to manipulate those around them into not questioning their actions and what they were doing. Their actions did not always comport with their teachings, and so you'll hear how those teachings evolved. They changed over time to justify or to support the actions of the defendant and Chad Daybell. You will hear how the defendant told others, because she was translated, she didn't have to repent. Again, doesn't count for me. You'll also hear how when she and Alex first moved here, Alex was setting the Wi-Fi password. He tells Lori in a message, I set the password, too many kids. Lori's short response, funny. That's before the kids went missing when they moved here. In the month or so after her children were last seen, what you will hear is the defendant went on several trips. She went on a trip to Arizona, and that trip was around October 9th of 2019. And that's a date that you will hear about. The defendant went to Arizona to visit her niece, Melanie Boudreaux, also known as Melanie Pulowski, another individual that you will hear more about and you will hear from during this trial. While she was down visiting her niece, Zulema Pastenis came over and Lori led a casting on Tammy. Meanwhile, back in Idaho, what you will hear is on October 9th of 2019, that same day, Tammy came home from work, parked her car, went to get things out of the back, and came face to face with a masked man holding a gun and pointing at her. You will hear how Tammy heard a couple pops and the gunman ran off. What you will also hear is that later, a phone call was overheard between Lori and an unknown individual. Lori was mad. On October 9th of 2019, she was mad. And she made a statement along the lines of, he can't do anything right. What we also know is that there was a were some phone calls that night between she and at least Chad Daybell. Not long after that trip to Arizona, you will hear how Lori then traveled to Missouri with her niece, Melanie. And while in Missouri, they visited some sites, and then they met up with an individual named Audrey Martario, a 
another woman that you will hear more about and you will hear from during this trial. And while they were there in Missouri, Lori led another casting on Tammy. By this time, you'll hear that the defendant and Chad had determined Tammy was dark. Tammy was possessed. She was possessed by an evil spirit named Viola. Shortly after the trip to Missouri, you will hear how Tammy, or excuse me, how Lori then traveled to Hawaii. She traveled to Hawaii again with her niece, Melanie, and Audrey joined them while they were there. And Lori was actually in Hawaii at the time of Tammy's death on or about October 19th of 2019. You will, what you won't hear with any of these trips that the defendant went on, you won't hear about JJ or Tylee because they weren't with her. They weren't with her when she went to Arizona. They weren't with her when she went to Missouri. And they were not with her when she went to Hawaii. But what you will hear about is how the defendant was still spending their money. She was also sending her other son, Colby, money using Tylee's phone. So Tylee's phone was with her, but Tylee wasn't. You will hear how when she was in Hawaii, she was in constant or consistent contact with Chad. You'll hear how just after Tammy died, she hurried back to Idaho. And just after returning to Idaho, you will hear how the defendant began to insert herself into Chad Daybell's life. It was as if Tammy never existed. The defendant met his kids, came to his house, and Chad started to introduce her to some of his friends. And you will hear how Chad introduced her to some of his neighbors a little over a week after Tammy's passing. And you'll hear from those neighbors, those friends of Chad's. And you will hear how when they were introduced to Lori for the first time, she and Chad couldn't keep their hands off each other. Tammy hasn't been dead that long. They talk about plans to get married. But maybe most interestingly, Chad Daybell makes a statement when Lori's asked about kids that she had a young daughter that had recently died. Lori says nothing about JJ. No mention of a young son. No correcting Chad on the whereabouts or if her daughter was alive or not. Just some indication about, well, I, I've got some stepkids. Not long after that meeting, the defendant was in Hawaii on a beach marrying Chad Daybell. They got married in Hawaii on November 5th of 2019. You will hear how the defendant had actually begun looking for Malachite wedding rings as early as May of 2019. You will hear how the Malachite stone was important to them. What you will also hear is on their wedding day, they exchanged Malachite rings. And in May of 2019, when the defendant was looking for those rings, both of their spouses were alive and well. You will hear also how Chad Daybell began checking into adding the defendant to his life insurance, or excuse me, to his health insurance policy. And when he went to fill out that application, you will hear how he said, no minor children. There's no minors that need to be added to this policy, just the defendant. You'll hear how similarly he was looking for a rental property for them in Hawaii. And on that application, same thing, no minor children, just Chad and Lori, just Chad and the defendant, just the way they wanted it. On November 26th of 2019, Law enforcement showed up at the apartments located at 565 Pioneer Road in Rexburg, Idaho. They were looking for JJ. It was still unknown that Tylee was missing at this point. Chad Daybell was there with Alex Cox and law enforcement made contact with them. Finally, later that same day, they were able to contact the defendant regarding the whereabouts of JJ. 
The defendant was less than forthcoming with law enforcement at that time. She told law enforcement that J.J. was with her friend Melanie Gibb in Arizona. The problem with this? She told Melanie J.J. was with Kay Woodcock, his grandmother. Problem with that? Kay Woodcock is the one that had reported J.J. missing to law enforcement. So where was J.J.? And where was Tylee, for that matter? The defendant did not cooperate in locating them. Instead, when law enforcement returned, she cleared out her apartment and moved to Hawaii with Chad, her new husband. While Chad and Lori were starting their new life together in Hawaii, law enforcement had begun a massive search for J.J. and Tylee. It became a nationwide search for those children. As they were searching for the children and beginning their investigation, they talked to Melanie Gibb because Lori had said that J.J. was with Melanie. Melanie had been asked to not talk to law enforcement by Chad. She'd been asked to tell law enforcement J.J. was with her by Lori, even so far as Lori saying, snap a picture of some kids. <laughs> send it to law enforcement, basically. Melanie Gibb wasn't sure what to do, but eventually she came forward with, to law enforcement and said, J.J. was never with me. Never had him. Don't know where he is. Because of everything that had gone on, Melanie Gibb, on December 8th of 2019, decides to place a phone call to Chad and the defendant. She wants to know, where's J.J.? And why did you ask me to tell law enforcement he was with me? What's going on? She recorded that conversation. And what we know from that conversation and what you will hear is the defendant refused to disclose where JJ was, but claimed he was happy. Claimed and ultimately ended up saying she knew exactly where JJ was. I remind you, JJ was last seen on September 22nd of 2019. This is December 8th of 2019. And I'll remind you how JJ was found. And yet the defendant's statement to Melanie Gibb was, I know exactly where he is. When confronted about Tammy's death, the defendant indicated they did what they had to do. Now remember, Chad and Lori had determined Tammy was dark. And if someone's dark and castings don't work, the body has to be destroyed. They did what they had to do. The defendant and Chad did what they had to do to remove any and every obstacle that was in their way of getting exactly what they wanted. On December 11th of 2019, Tammy was removed from her restful, um, from her resting place to be examined. And it was determined by the office of the Utah Medical Examiner that Tammy died at the hands of another and that the cause of her death was asphyxiation. You will hear how around the time of Tammy's exhumation Alex Cox made a statement along the lines of, I hope I'm not their fall guy. What exactly Alex meant by this or what he knew, we may never know because Alex Cox died the next day on December 12th of 2019. What we do know though, is there were communications between Alex Cox the defendant, and Chad Daybell. We know in those conversations there was discussions of people being light and dark, and we know the location of Alex's phone and Chad's phone on certain dates and times. We know that on October 9th of 2019, the day Tammy was confronted by a masked gunman, that Alex Cox's phone had been in the area earlier in the day driving by where the Daybell residence is located. The only person Alex Cox knew in the Salem area 
was Chad Daybell. We know that on September 9th of 2019, the morning after the last day Tylee is seen, we know Alex Cox's phone is in Chad Daybell's backyard on his property close to where Tylee's remains are found. We also know around that same time, Chad Daybell's phone is there on his property close to where Tylee's body is found. We also know from other witnesses that Alex Cox would do whatever the defendant and Chad asked him to do. He was loyal to them to a fault. You have already heard from the state that we have the burden in this case, but I want to reiterate that. We as the state have the burden to prove each and every element beyond a reasonable doubt. You have heard that term and you will hear it again, reasonable doubt. The court is the judge of the law and the judge will give you the definition of the law. And the judge will specifically provide a definition of reasonable doubt and you follow his definition. But I will say reasonable doubt is commonly defined as a doubt that would cause a reasonable person to hesitate to act. And I would emphasize reasonable. The defendant is charged with multiple crimes and you just heard him in the indictment. Conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft in relation to the death of Tylee Ryan, her daughter. First degree murder in relation to the death of Tylee Ryan, her daughter. Conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft in relation to JJ Vallow, her son. First degree murder in relation to JJ Vallow, her son. Conspiracy to commit first degree murder in relation to Tammy Daybell. And grand theft for the taking of the social security monies. Again, the judge will advise you on the law, but keep in mind that when we talk about the term conspiracy, it is two or more persons combining or conspiring, so essentially a meeting of the minds to commit some crime. And then one of those actors, just one, has to do an overt act in furtherance of that conspiracy. Only one person has to do it, and there only has to be one overt act. What that means is the defendant doesn't have to be the one that physically ended anyone's life for her to be guilty of conspiracy. If you determine that there is a meeting of the minds and one actor did one overt act in furtherance of that. Similarly, in the state of Idaho, Idaho law allows for someone to be charged as a principal. When someone is charged as a principal to a crime, it can include them directly committing the act, aiding and abetting in its commission, or it can include them having advised and encouraged its commission or commanding or coercing another to commit the crime. So similarly, similarly, when you're hearing about the first degree murder, the defendant did not have to physically end someone's life for her to be guilty. First degree murder is deliberate, willful, and premeditated actions causing someone to die. Mind you, and circling back, when Tylee was found, as we talked about, all that was found was, ch was charred remains. Tylee's hands are gone. When JJ was found, his hands were bound and duct taped in front of his body. When Tammy was found, those hands, she was described as a computer whiz, never going to do anything on a computer again. And the defendant and Chad Daybell getting married on a beach in Hawaii, starting their life together, all obstacles gone. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I thank you for being here today and your willingness to serve on the jury. We recognize that you do have a task here and you are the judge of facts. And I would let you know 
that that is the most important job in this courtroom. This is set to be a long trial, and you're going to sit through a lot of evidence and a lot of testimony. What we ask you to do is be attentive to the testimony and evidence presented. Apply your common sense and reasonableness in weighing the evidence. Give every piece of evidence and testimony the weight you think it is due. Hold us to our burden, and we feel that if you apply your reason and common sense, I'm confident that you will return a verdict of guilty in this case. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Blake. That will conclude the opening statements for the state of Idaho. Will the defense be giving an opening statement now, or do you wish to defer until later? I'll give one now, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Mr. Archibald. You can present your opening now. Like the state of Idaho, I also thank you for your service. This is a difficult case, a case we have not been able to settle without you. That's why you've been called here to help us settle this case. If the court will allow a brief introduction, I know a lot about you with your 20-page questionnaires, so I'd like to just make a brief introduction of the defense. I've been an attorney since 1991. I've been both a private attorney and a public defender, and in small county Idaho, there's a lot of us lawyers who do both public defense work and private work. And so over the past 32 years, I've done a bit of both. I've been assigned to 27 murder cases over the course of my career, and they're difficult. They're difficult cases. I was assigned to this case. I'm paid by the taxpayers, and so thank you for paying your taxes. I've had a general practice where I do a little bit of everything, and then I get about one of these difficult cases a year assigned to me, and we do what we can. What does a defense lawyer do? We make sure that our client's constitutional rights are protected. We make sure that the government does its job. We make sure that proof beyond a reasonable doubt is in place before there's a decision. So with these difficult cases, we resolve 99% of our cases. Less than 1% of cases actually make it to trial. And so I believe the state and the defense, we generally do a good job of resolving our disputes, and sometimes when we can't, then we call on you to resolve it for us. I'm being assisted in this case by John Thomas. He's been an attorney since 1999. He has also both experience in private law firms and public defender's offices where he's handled many, many serious cases. He's received many accolades for his lawyering, and I appreciate him helping me. I also am being assisted by Brandon Hobbs. You've probably seen him, and he's an investigator, and so he's helped us investigate this case. Being a defense lawyer isn't always a popular job, so I appreciate you being respectful towards me, and I'll do the same. I'll be respectful towards you. Some eight years ago, my law office got bombed, and 
And so uh, some people are really upset by, by what I do for a living. And so I appreciate you uh, and your ability to decide the facts of this case uh, without uh, emotion overriding your decision. So this case is about Lori Vallow Daybell. Uh, the prosecutor has just told you what the government hopes to prove throughout the next month. Uh, so what's this story about from our defense perspective? And how does this story include you? So the evidence will show that Lori was born and raised in California. She's lived in California, Texas, Arizona, and Hawaii. Uh, she lived in Idaho for less than a month before the event of what you're here to decide. She's one of six children. Uh, her parents are still alive, they're retired. Uh, she's had an older sister and a brother die, and she also has a sister and a brother still living. Uh, she believes in life after death, and she believes she will see her deceased family, including her children, again. She's a beautician by trade. She's worked hard for our years in that profession. She's a mother of three, stepmother of two, and is now a grandmother of two children. The evidence will show that people were attracted to her as the state has told you. They've been attracted to her pretty smile, her vivacious personality, her fun-loving, happy-go-lucky personality. People wanted to be around her. Her oldest son is Colby Ryan. He was born in 1996 in Texas. Uh, he's a handsome young man, he currently lives in Arizona. He has two children of his own, making Lori a grandma. Her oldest daughter, Tylee Ryan, was born in 2002 in Texas. She was a ray of sunshine. She had health problems, pancreatitis, a painful and debilitating disease, but Tylee did the best she could. Her marriage to Joe Ryan ended and a painful, long, drawn-out custody battle ensued. And it was hard on all of them. The evidence will show that her next husband, Charles Vallow, was smitten with her and she with him. He had two kids, she had two kids, and the blended family lasted over a decade. Lori was such a, a good, responsible mother to her two children that her husband's sister, Kay Woodcock, wanted her to adopt a special needs toddler, newborn. Kay Woodcock was the grandma to a child born in Louisiana in 2012, a child with special needs. The child's parents couldn't take care of him because of their own personal problems. Apparently Kay Woodcock uh, couldn't take care of him either, so she asked her brother, Charles, and his wife, Lori, if they would adopt him, and they agreed. So the child born in Louisiana, the struggling parents, was adopted by Charles and Lori Vallow in 2014, and he became known as J.J. Vallow, Lori's third child. The evidence will show that Lori was a dutiful wife to Charles Vallow, they both worked hard, he at the office, and she at home. She was a kind and loving mother to her children. The evidence will show she had a particular interest in religion in the end of times. You will recognize the quote-unquote end of times as something spoken of in the Holy Bible, the New Testament. Most of you will understand when I say that. Some people could care less about biblical prophecies. Some people care a lot about it. Thankfully, in this country, we get to worship how we choose. The evidence will show that once Lori 
and her friends met Chad Daybell, an author on religious subjects. Her beliefs began to morph and to change. And that's where you come into this story, because the, the stories diverge. So we haven't been able to agree on what happened, and we need you to decide it. So what happened? How did these children die? Who was involved? When did it happen? Where did it happen? Why? Why did it happen? The judge has read to you the allegations, the charges. And uh, so you've, they were read to you two weeks ago when you showed up to fill out your questionnaire. They were read again today. And I'm going to read parts of them again because I think it's important to see uh, what she's charged with. And you don't have to write these down, by the way. The jury instructions will be with you in the jury room. Uh, some of you are really good note takers, and some of you will let others take notes. Uh, but y you don't need to memorize what I'm telling you, because these, these will be printed out and, and handed to you in the jury room. So the, the charge of conspiracy, Chad, Lori, Alex, deceased. Other co-conspirators, both known and unknown. So Chad Daybell is not on trial here. Alex Cox is not on trial here. He's deceased. Other co-conspirators, I don't know much about that, both known and unknown. So, again, your focus will be on the actions of Lori. Not on Chad, not on Ac not on Alex, not on co-conspirators, both known and unknown. So that's the conspiracy. I think uh, first-degree murder, the allegations contained in, in the charge that the judge read to you was Lori Vallow concerned in the commission of first-degree murder. Did... Or did she aid and abet? Did she assist somehow? Or, the language of the charge says, or not being present, did she advise and encourage it to happen? Or, by command, compelled another? So, the this charge is did she kill or did she assist or did she encourage or did she command so in other words this charge is saying they're not sure what happened but yet they want you to be sure the same with count three and count four with JJ. Count five, five with Tammy. Did she combine or conspire to commit murder? Did she do the murder? Or did she talk about it? Or did she do something about it? Or did she do an act in furtherance of it? So that's the challenge here for you is you're going to be given all these al alternatives and you're going to have to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. I didn't make up the definition for reasonable doubt, neither did the judge, neither did the prosecutors, but that's our law. He read it to you two weeks ago and again this morning and here it is. Under our law and system of justice, Every defendant is presumed to be innocent. This means two things. First, the state has the burden of proving the defendant guilty. The state has that burden throughout the trial. The defendant is never required to prove her innocence. 
nor does the defendant ever have to produce any evidence at all. The state must prove the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is not mere possible or imaginary doubt. It is a doubt based on reason and common sense. It may arise from a careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence or, or from lack of evidence. So if you have a lack of evidence and that's reasonable to you, you're our reasonable people here for the next month. That's a reasonable doubt. If after considering all the evidence or the lack of evidence, you have a reasonable doubt about Lori's guilt, you must find her not guilty. Sorry, all these papers in here, I lost my way. So, uh, there's something called an alibi that was filed as part of this response, uh, part of these allegations. So here's the alibi that was filed on Lori's behalf. Lori Vallow was in her own apartment in Rexburg, Idaho, when J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan died in the apartment of Alex Cox in Rexburg, Idaho. Lori was with Melanie Gibb, David Warwick, and or Chad Daybell. And Lori was in Hawaii when Tammy Daybell died at the home of Chad Daybell in Salem, Idaho. Lori was with Melanie Bedro and or Audrey Baratario in Hawaii. So that's the alibi filed in this case. And a lot of jurors were excused in this case because of pretrial publicity. We asked you a lot of questions about that, what you, what you knew, what you heard, what, if you can set it aside. And so far, still, no evidence has been presented to you. So my client is still presumed innocent. And the publicity that has tainted so many people throughout the county, through the state, through the nation, that's not evidence. And so I appreciate all of you stating that you, anything that you may have heard, a lot of you didn't hear anything, so thank you. But for those of you who did hear something, you can set that aside and start this trial with Lori with a clean slate. You're here to focus on what she did, not on what Chad Daybell did or what Alex Cox did. You're here to determine if there even was a conspiracy. Cases, again, can be solved with evidence. They can be solved with lack of evidence. And when there's lack of evidence, the law calls it not guilty. You said you would be fair and impartial. You said you would have an open mind to not judge her until you heard all the evidence in this courtroom. You said you would do your duty, and I believe you. If what the state has alleged here cannot be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you said you would find her not guilty. Thank you for your attention.
All right, thank you, Mr. Archibald. That will conclude the opening statement of the defense. Uh, in just a moment, we'll take a mid-morning break. Uh, pursuant, again, to our order in this courtroom, you're allowed on the break to leave and then be reseated once the break is done. One comment I wanted to make uh, as it related to the note-taking and what was said in openings, and I'll confirm that, you will be provided all of the instructions at your deliberations. This is a long trial, and so uh, I wanted to confirm that is, in fact, the case, that the instructions that provide both the law, uh, the charging language of the indictment, and other things will be provided to you in copies there. So don't worry that you need to get all that down in notes during the course of the trial. So with that in mind, then, uh, I believe the state will have its first witness ready to call after the mid-morning break. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor, that is correct. Okay, and who will be conducting the uh, first uh, examination of the witness? That will be Rob Wood. Okay, thank you. Well, with that in mind, then, let's go ahead and take our mid-morning recess. And one last thing, I do appreciate very much the way everybody has conducted themselves during this trial thus far with a capacity courtroom. I very much appreciate everyone complying with those orders and the manner in which we're off to a start here. So we'll take our mid-morning recess and reconvene here in about 15 to 20 minutes. All rise. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you. Okay, we just concluded the break uh, for the mid-morning. We're back on the record on CR 22-211624. State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. We're about to have our first witness called. Before we do that, uh, one issue I'd like to bring up as it relates to a uh, complaint made by certain jurors. That we've got the ability for people to take notes if they want in here, but you have to have a device that's not loud and not distracting, and we've already got complaints of distract, uh, distraction from devices that are being too loud when people are typing on them. So we'll pay attention to that. If you don't have a quiet enough device, you'll be asked to leave if your device is causing any sort of distraction for the jurors. That goes along with the conduct order we've got in the case, and that's mostly happened over in the section closest to the jurors. So we'll keep an eye on that as we proceed forward. Also, uh, apparently we've got a request for sidebar from counsel before we bring the jurors in. So I'll take that up at this time with the, with the uh, parties. I would like you to go to that side and try it out. <laughs> no, it's, it was pretty intense. <laughs> so, you know, I, I could try going over there or be softer, I guess. Uh, I'm sure someone will be friendly enough to switch with you. It was just the whole kick off on you. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, we've got the simulcast up again. At this time, I'd ask the bailiffs to please bring the jurors in. All right, thank you. Please be seated. All right, Mr. Wood, the state can call its first witness. Thank you. The state calls Kay Woodcock. All right, Ms. Woodcock, if you'd please come forward, and I'll have you pause out here when you get to the middle and raise your right hand. All right, if you'd please pause there for a moment, raise your right hand, and I'll have you placed under oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, about the truth, about the truth? Okay, you can be seated in the witness box up here. Counsel, before you inquire, just to make clear, we are making a stenographic record of the proceedings. Please answer questions verbally with a yes or a no instead of gestures. Try not to talk at the same time as anyone asking you a question. And with that in mind, Mr. Wood, you may inquire. Thank you. Could you state your name for the court and spell out your last name? Ethel Kathleen Vallow Woodcock. Uh, my, I go by K. Uh, last name is W O O D C O C K. Thank you, Ms. Woodcock. Where do you reside? Lake Charles, Louisiana. Okay. How long have you lived there? All my life, pretty much. All right. Ms. Woodcock, do you have any children? Yes. How many do you have? Two. Okay. Have you have either of those children? ever had a child they were unable to care for? Yes. Okay, let me ask you about that. Uh, which of those children 
had said had this child they couldn't care for. My son, Dennis Todd Trahan. And what was the... Uh, Well, maybe I need a new place to live. I don't know if that it's, it's, it's not mobile. It's. I'm wondering if it's working. Okay, it is picking up a signal. So, okay. um, if you could just try to, I guess, speak right into it, and hopefully yeah. we can pick you okay. up. Okay. Thank you. Okay. What was the name of the? the child who had a child they couldn't care for. Dennis Todd Trahan. Tell me about that situation. What, uh, what occurred? Um, he and his girlfriend, Mandy Leger, uh, had issues and neither, uh, she got pregnant. They couldn't take care of him, of Canaan, JJ. Um, he was, born when he was born he was born with drugs in his system okay um when was this child born may 25th 2012 okay and what was the child's name canaan todd trahan thank you now you stated he had drugs in his system were there any other complications he was born uh at 30 weeks that's 10 weeks premature he had a, a myriad of issues. Um, I, I can't, you know, I'm not a doctor. I can't explain all of them. But he uh, was in neonatal ICU for seven weeks, six to seven weeks. Okay. After he left the hospital, where did he live? With He came home with myself and my husband, Larry. Okay. And can you state Larry's name for the record? Larry James Woodcock. Okay. And why did he come home with you? The state took uh, custody of Canaan when he was born because of the drugs in his system. And we were uh, deemed as his caregivers until they gave the uh, Todd and Mandy a chance to... Uh, work out their their plan that they help them try and become you know independent un, yeah okay state gave them to us. were were todd and mandy ever able to regain custody of canaan no okay how long did you have canaan we got him in early july of 2012 and charles and Lori. Got him in mid February of 2013. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you there. Um, who is Charles? My brother. What is his full name? Leland Charles Anthony Vallow. Okay, and who is Lori? His wife. Okay, um, and what was her name? Lori. Full, full name. Well, when I knew her, it was Lori Ryan, so Lori Ryan Vallow. Okay. Is Lori Vallow in this courtroom today? Yes. Can you point to where she's sitting and describe what she's wearing for the court? She's sitting there at the defendant's table, I guess in a black jacket. Okay. Your Honor, the state would ask the court to uh, take notice that the defendant has been identified. Uh, it's so noted in the record. So let's go back. You stated uh, that you had Canaan until around February of 2013. Yes. And so, and I believe you stated that Charles and Lori took Canaan at that point. Yes. Why did they take Canaan? They were granted legal custody. Okay. Um, did you ask them to take custody of Canaan? No, uh, actually, it was uh, Charles had approached Charles and Lori approached us, and Larry and I were going to be given the the option to adopt him first before anyone, and um, then Charles uh, and Lori approached us saying that they would love to adopt him if 
you know, he, he was very, talked very gingerly about it because it was a very sensitive subject. And we, you know, I was like, look, we'll think about it, but, you know, we, we just have to think about this. That's a big decision. And, um, okay. Why did, in the end, did Charles and Lori adopt Canaan? Yes. And why did you feel, or why did you allow that to happen? They seem, well, number one, Charles wanted, it, it, I, I need to back this up with that other question, if I may. They wanted to have a child of their own. He had two kids, she had two kids. They wanted to have a child together. Anyway, I'm sorry, ask your question again. Uh, why did you allow Charles and Lori to adopt Canaan? They had a, a much different lifestyle than Larry and I did. All we did was work and, and work and go home. Um, uh, they had, they were a busy lifestyle. They were very family oriented. You know, Lori was active in the community. Charles was active. They were very active in the church. She just seemed to be the kind of mom that every mom wants to be. Okay. And so did that adoption take place? Yes. Okay. When Canaan was adopted, uh, did he move from Lake Charles, Louisiana? Yes. Where did he go? They moved to Chandler, Arizona. Okay. Where they were living. Yeah. And is that in Maricopa County? Yes. When Canaan was adopted, did his name change? Yes. Do you know what his name was changed to? Joshua Jackson Vallow. Okay. And did did Joshua go by a nickname? JJ. Okay. So, just for clarity's sake, I'll refer to him as JJ from here on out. Okay. Did you and Larry Woodcock maintain a relationship with JJ after he was adopted? Yes, actually that was a condition of the adoption was that we had, you know, we had to keep, maintain access to him and maintain our grandparent role, which they, they were very glad, they were, they were good with that, Charles and Lori. Okay, um, and so JJ was living in Chandler, Arizona and you were in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Yes. How often did you see JJ? Every chance we could. Okay, and, and how often was that? We flew out there every, uh, I know when they left with him in February of 13, we were out there less than a month later because we were having a very hard time detaching from him. You know, we missed him really badly. Um, but then any time, you know, it averaged about every three months when they were in Arizona that we were able to go visit. Okay. Um, after they adopted JJ, did Lori and Charles ever move from Arizona? Yes, they moved to Hawaii. Okay, where in Hawaii did they move? Princeville. Okay, do you know what island that's on? Hawaii. Okay. Uh, once they moved to Hawaii, were you able to maintain contact with JJ? Yes. Approximately how often would you maintain contact with JJ? Since Hawaii was a, a much bigger flight, a, a much longer flight to get to, so yes, we went. I went, averaged out every five to six months, and I would stay, or if Larry was with me, we would stay like at least a week and maybe 10 days, a week to, to 10 days. Okay. Um, did you have any other type of contact with JJ? Um, through through phones or digital contact? Oh, when he learned to FaceTime, yes, he FaceTimed us all the time. Okay. And the phone, too. He would call us all the time. All right. Uh, what was your relationship like with Charles and Lori? It was good. I mean, Charles and I were very close. Um, he was my, my brother, and... You know, we, we always got along. We we were very close. And um, and Lori, she was a, she was just a doll. Uh, we were good friends. Um, we talked 
you know, all the time. I mean, we didn't make a lot of phone calls between each other, but when we saw each other, it was very, um, it was, it was like we hadn't missed a, a, a day of not talking. Okay. Did you have time to, did you ever spend time with other members of her family? Yes. Okay. Did Lori have any other children? Yes. Do you recall who they were? Yes. Um, Colby Ryan and Tylee Ryan. Okay. Who was oldest? Colby. Okay. Did you ever meet other members of Lori's family? Yes, there were some birthday parties and, and things, uh, maybe Fourth of July stuff, but yes, I did. Who do you recall meeting? Um, her parents, Barris, Barry and Janice Cox. Um, uh, she had a brother, Alex Cox, and her other brother, Adam Cox. Okay. Anybody else in the family you recall meeting? Not that I recall. Okay. You mentioned Alex Cox. Do you know approximately how many times you met Alex Cox? A handful of times, maybe. Sometimes he would stay with them, and so I would see him when I went to visit. Okay. Uh, to your knowledge, is Alex Cox living or deceased? Deceased. Do you know approximately when that happened? December 12th, 2019. Okay. Did Charles and Lori ever move back from Hawaii? Yes. When was that? It was around Christmas or New Year's of 2016. <clears throat> okay. And did you maintain uh, a visit? Did you continue to visit JJ in Arizona when they moved back? Yes, we did. Okay. Uh, did you ever see Tylee at the home? I, we did. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yes, yeah, she she was around there. She was her, being her good little sister self to JJ. Um, she would often go to her grandparents while we were there. I don't know why that was, but and as she got older, she was busy with her friends and stuff. But absolutely, we we uh, spent time together. Okay. What did you observe? in the relationship between Lori and JJ? I witnessed, she was a, a doting mom. She was very engaged. She was, um, uh, one, I know one time when we went, he was probably a year old, uh, she had a photo album and she had pictures in it and she had pictures of me and Larry and uh, uh, other people and um, she's, she was reinforcing uh, that we were his grandparents. She would point to him and say, that's Mama, and point to the next picture, that's Papa. And um, she, was, she was a good mom for, for everything I could see. Okay. Uh, what did you observe in the relationship between Charles and JJ? Charles was hands-on. He was engaged. He um, took a lot of... Uh, when Charles was traveling for business, Lori had him all to herself. But when Charles got home from his businesses, he, he had J.J. all the time. Okay. I'm going to talk to you about the year 2019. Do you recall the first time you saw J.J. in 2019? It was right around the 1st of February. Okay. Where was that? In I in Chandler or in the Phoenix area, one of the Maricopa County. Okay. So is, is Chandler uh, in the Phoenix, the general Phoenix area? It's a suburb, yes. Okay. Uh, do you recall how long you stayed there? Um, that time was about probably two weeks. Okay. Uh, was there a specific reason you had come out to visit that time? Yes, um, Charles uh, reached out that um, he and Lori had split up, that um, she she was gone, and he was totally very distraught. So I went, to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I went to help him with JJ. No, I'm not and, object here. This is hearsay evidence that's coming in. Your Honor, I haven't heard any hearsay yet. 
<coughs> hadn't heard that yet either. Um, do we have water for the witness? Yeah. I, okay. I, okay. I, I didn't know if you needed any. I, I couldn't do. see if you had any down there, but no. feel free to take that and have that ready. <coughs> Objections overruled. Yes. So, Ms. Woodcock, uh, you had stated that you were in the process of saying that you were out there because Lori was gone. Yes. Okay. Were you aware of where Lori was? No. To your knowledge, was Charles aware of where Lori was? No. Okay. Uh, did you see Lori at all while you were there? No. Uh, you stated you were there for a couple of weeks. Did you take JJ with you after that at all? Yes, I, I brought him home to Louisiana with me. Charles needed to go to work, so, and we were ready to have him in Louisiana. Okay. Approximately how long did you have him in Louisiana? Um, probably a week, maybe two. Uh, I, I, we, during that time frame, uh, in two, from like February 1st till the end of March, we were back and forth uh, to Louisiana, to Phoenix, to Louisiana, Phoenix, with JJ, you know, just busy trying to help Charles get things squared away. Okay, and I'm sorry, I might have missed it. Did you say, did you mention a time frame in which you were going back and forth between Louisiana? Yes, between February 1st of 2019 like, and uh, through the end of March of 2019. Okay. Uh, did you stop going to Arizona? Yes. Why was that? Because we moved Charles to Houston. Charles and JJ. Okay. And when Charles and JJ moved to Houston, was Lori with them? No. Okay. Why did Charles move to Houston, to your knowledge? So we could help him... Well, he didn't have any family in, in Arizona. It was all just her family. Um, JJ needed good schools, um, which they had in Houston. They didn't, we didn't really have any in Lake Charles. Uh, and Lake Charles is two and a half hours from Houston. We would be able to, whenever Charles would go out of town, took a work. Uh, he was gone maybe three days when he would go to work. And I would... That way I could be in Houston with J.J. while Charles was gone, and he wouldn't, ha he wouldn't be with a stranger, and I could get him back and forth to school and just be take care of him while Charles would be working. Okay. Uh, approximately how far is it between Houston and Lake Charles, Louisiana? 150 miles. Okay, so that's, that's a drive that you can do. Yeah, just straight down I-10. Okay. Uh, and did you ever have occasion to go to Houston and stay with J.J. while Charles was gone? Yes. Okay. How many times did you do that? There was once. Charles moved there like March 31st of 2019, um, and he he did need to get some work. He, need, he needed to go to work. Um, so I went to Houston and stayed with JJ for probably three days, I think it was that time. And uh, Charles went and did his work. JJ and I, we had a good time. Okay. I'm just going to briefly ask you a few questions about Charles's business. What did he do? He was a financial planner. Uh, he mostly sold annuities. Okay. Um, at any time, did you become involved in helping Charles with his business? Yes. When was that? In February of 2019. So in the same time period we've been discussing. Yes. Why did you start helping Charles with this business? He asked me to help him out because he couldn't, he, he was very distraught with Lori for one thing, for their separation. And he just needed help. I helped him with his payroll, his accounts payable, receivable. I, my husband Larry and I owned a business, so I was very familiar with the workings of a, a business or being self-employed. And um, so I, I did what I could to help him. Okay. And so through this help, did you have access to Charles' banking information? Yes. Did you have access to his emails? Yes. 
Okay. Did you have access to uh, uh, other financial information? Yes. Okay. Did anything happen in April that changed uh, the situation and arrangement you had with Charles? Yes. What was that? Lloyd uh, went back, went to Houston, moved in with, to Houston with Charles and JJ. Okay. Can Can um, you state that again to be clear for the record? Oh, Charles and uh, Lori moved to Houston with Charles and JJ. Okay. Um, and you said that was sometime in April of 2019? Yes. Okay. After that, did you continue to see JJ uh, in the Houston or Lake Charles area at all? Oh, yes. Often. Okay. Uh, how often? Every weekend he would come or every other weekend, just whenever he could get away, he would he would bring JJ. And they would come for the weekend, which we were more than happy to have them. Okay. Did Lori stay in Houston? Are you aware if Lori stayed in Houston? As in, um, like... Did she stay? I, I apologize. Did she continue to live in Houston? Um, as far as I knew, she was go to Phoenix and I don't know where else, but... <clears throat> I don't know exactly what her travels were at the time, but I know Charles would come sometimes and say, well, Lori's calling this weekend, or, you know, she went to do this this weekend. I don't remember the specifics. Okay. Um, did she move from Houston? Yes. In June of 19, she Charles secured her a home in uh, Chandler, which is oh. a suburb of Phoenix. Okay. And when Lori moved back to the Phoenix area, where was Charles staying at that time? He wasn't staying there. He still had a home in Houston, but he, uh, when he, when he would uh, get a hotel. Okay. Um, at that time, to your knowledge, are you aware if Charles was intending to divorce Lori? Yes. Okay. Do you know if he was ever able to finalize that divorce? No. Okay. To your knowledge, is Charles Vallow alive or deceased? He's dead. Do you know the date he died? July 11th, 2019. Okay. To your knowledge, did Charles Vallow have a life insurance policy? Yes. Did you ever have an occasion to speak with him about that policy? Yes. Um, when was that? In February of 2019, he approached me and said he wanted to name me the beneficiary. It was a million dollar policy and he wanted to name me beneficiary uh, and take Lori off. Okay. Uh, did you ask him to name you as the beneficiary? No. Okay. Uh, during that conversation, did you commit to doing anything with that life insurance policy money if you were the beneficiary? Yes. Uh, what did you commit to do with that money? To finish raising, to finish raising JJ because Lori didn't want him anymore. And did you commit to doing anything else with that money? Um, yes, uh, he had asked me to uh, give half of it to his two adult sons, which I did. Okay. Did you ever have another conversation with Charles about that life insurance policy? <clears throat> um, I... I I can't remember at this moment. It might come to me in a minute. I'm sorry. That's okay. <clears throat> but is it fair to say you don't remember having another conversation with him? I don't remember right at this moment. Okay. Oh, wait. I do know that. It wouldn't be hearsay if she did have a conversation with him. The existence of a conversation isn't hearsay. 
right, Mr. Wood, uh, why don't you ask another question? I, there's a pending objection, but I don't know that this would be responsive to that, so if you'd re-ask. Okay. I did. Oh, we've got another question okay. that will be posed before you can answer. Sorry. After Charles's death, did you receive uh, the benefit of that life insurance policy? Yes, it, it was unexpected because I, I never knew, I never followed up with Charles to see if he had changed me to his beneficiary. Um, but yes, I did, probably within a week of his death. Okay. Um, and how did you find out about that? The insurance company called me. Okay. Did Lori Vallow ever contact you about the life insurance policy? Yes. Do you know what number she texted you from? Or let me rephrase that. How did she contact you? Through a text. And do you recall what number she texted you from? No. Uh, did you have her saved as a contact in your phone? Yes, she had actually had two numbers in my phone. Okay. And do you know what those two numbers are? Yes. Can I... I have a well, paper with it on there. Do you remember those numbers off of the top of your head? No. Um, in anticipation of the day, did you um, make a record of what those numbers were if you couldn't remember it? Yes. Would it refresh your memory to look at those numbers? Yes. Your Honor, I'd ask, uh, well, what kind of uh, document did you prepare to, to see those numbers? I just did a screen print and um, I have it on and made a copy. Okay. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be allowed to uh, look at those documents to refresh your memory. Any objection? No, Your Honor. All right. You can go ahead and just indicate on the record what it is specifically you've looked at, and then after you've looked at that, put it away or turn it off if it's a device, and then we'll... It's... I have it right here. Okay. I so printed it. papers, it yeah. appears. If you'll just look at those, and then uh, once you've refreshed your recollection, set those aside, and then Mr. Wood will ask another question. Do you want... Have you had a chance to look at those? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you recall the numbers you had stored in your phone for Lori? Yes. Uh, what was the first one? 480-489-4652. Um, and what was the second? 480-692-9562. Thank you. Mrs. Woodcock, do you recall the last time you saw J.J. Vallow in person? Yes. Um, where was that? Lake Charles. Do you recall when it was? The weekend of May 17th. We, and I remember it vividly because we gave him a birthday party because his birthday was May 25th. Okay. Um, And did you, so you saw him at his birthday party? Yes, and they spent Where was the that? I'm sorry. It's okay. Where was that? At Mr. Gaddy's, a pizza place in town. Okay, and and then did he spend that, was it a weekend? Yes, they spent the weekend with us, and we gave him the party on the Saturday, and um, then the Sunday afternoon they left to go back to Houston. And that Charles. was... To, just to be clear, that was the last time you saw him in person? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> after, you, after the last time you saw him in person, did you ever have contact with him again? Um, I think we may have had a phone call or two when he was with Charles, yes, but okay. that was about it. All right. After Charles passed away on July 11th, <clears throat> did you ever have contact with him again? Yes. Uh, tell me, well, do you remember how many times you had contact with JJ? Three times. Do you recall the first time you did? Yes. How did you have contact with him? It was a FaceTime. Okay. Do you recall when that was? It was probably, let's see, he, June 11th, so probably around June 20th, I'm sorry, July 20th. 
Uh, probably about a week or so after Charles's death. Okay. Was there anything about that contact <clears throat> that stood out to you? Yes. Um, what he, was that? He normally had uh, an iPad or a phone, and he would walk around and talk to Larry and me. And it was always so funny because he wouldn't hold the device to him. He would walk around and we'd see the ceiling in most of the places that they lived. But he, anyway, it was always funny. Um, but yes, he he would hold the iPad or the device and he would talk until he was ready to hang up. And so that's how you normally communicated with him on yes. FaceTime. On the on this specific incident that I asked you about, was there anything different about your communication with him? Yes, um, he was did not have the device in his hand. Somebody was holding it for him, um, and he normally, like I said, he normally always had it. But it was a very short call, um, and he would look up, and whoever it was was obviously taller than him. But he was having a bad... <clears throat> taller than him. I'll just... And you, you said it was a short call. Do yeah. you recall approximately how long it lasted? Probably maybe 30 to 45 seconds. Okay. Um, did you have any other contact with him by FaceTime after that? Yes. I, do you recall the next time you did? Yes. Uh, when approximately was that? It was in, um, in the evening time, and again, he was not holding the device. He was, uh, this time he was in a really foul mood, and um, he just really didn't want to talk. And I remember he, you know, didn't, he just didn't want to talk. He was, he was having a little meltdown. So I remember being very upset that Lloyd waited till that time of the evening or he was very tired. He was overly tired probably. And he, he just, he didn't want to talk. Okay. So I was very upset about that. About how approximately how long did that conversation last? It was under a minute, 30, 45 seconds, maybe a minute. Okay. Did you have any other contact with J.J. Vallow? The last FaceTime, the last contact that we ever had with him was on August the 10th of 19. And that was a 35 second FaceTime. And he, again, was not holding the iPad or the device. Um, he just said, hi, Mama, hi, Papa. And then then he looked up as if as if someone, whoever was holding the device, and he goes, got to go, Mama, got to go. How do you say it? Got to go, Mama, got to go, Papa. Bye. Okay. And that was it. So that was the end of the conversation. That was it, yes. So it was a, a short conversation. Yes. And that was the last time you ever had contact with J.J. Vallow? Yes. On August 10th, 2019? Yes. Okay. Did you attempt to have contact with J.J. after that? Yes. Okay. How would you attempt to have contact with J.J.? I, uh, myself and Larry would, it was call, email, text, voicemail, any way we could, but I never got any response from her. Okay. Um, I'm going to take you back in time a little bit. Did you attempt to arrange with Lori for JJ to attend Charles's memorial service? Yes. Where was Charles's memorial service held? In Lake Charles. Okay. How did you communicate about that with Lori? I, I don't remember if it was a phone call or a text, I don't know, but she had agreed that J.J. could attend the memorial service. Okay, and did you have a plan for picking him up and the <laughs> logistics of that? Yes, I was. Uh, I bought plane tickets for me to go to Phoenix and pick him up 
get him from her and to fly back to Lake Charles and attend his memorial service, his dad's memorial service. And we were going to have him for a week. And then I was going to fly back to Phoenix with him and give him to Lori and then then fly home. Okay. Uh, did JJ end up attending his father's memorial service? No, he wasn't allowed to. Okay. And did you speak with Lori about that or communicate with Lori about that? She, again, she wouldn't answer any of my, any time I tried to reach out, she wouldn't answer me. Okay. Uh, was Lori at Charles's memorial service? No. Okay. Your Honor, I'm going to hand or have ask the bailiff to hand show to the defense and hand the witness a self-authenticating document. All right, is there a courtesy copy for the court? I, I don't have a courtesy copy for the court. Right, well, it's, it's in an evidence bag. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is it on the exhibit list? Yes. <clears throat> like to review that as well. And Your Honor, this may be a good uh, time for me to lodge an objection outside the presence of the jury. I don't know if the court wants to do a sidebar first or, or what. All right. If that's the case, Mr. Thomas, I'll suggest we'll take our lunch recess at this time <clears throat> and ask the jurors to be excused before we do that and then I can take up the objection you're going to lodge once they've been excused to the jury room for the lunch break. So let's go ahead and do that now then so if all would rise for the jury. All right. Thank you. Please be seated. Mr. Thomas, if you've got an objection, you can indicate that at this time. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, may I have Vaudeer and Ada an objection? Yes. All right. Uh, Ms. Woodcock, um, a little earlier in the testimony, you were looking at uh, some papers uh, that you indicated refreshed your recollection about some uh, text messages. Is that correct? Yeah, well, where I got responses or whatever from Laura, yes. Okay. And where did you get those papers? I've had a, I had her numbers in my phone. Where did you get the papers that you had? Oh, I printed them. You printed them yourself? Um, no, I, I, I brought them, I sent them, I emailed them to somebody, Laura, uh, Somebody on the mm -hmm. prosecution team, and they printed them for me. Oh, so, so you've had contact with the prosecution team? Yes. Okay. And how many times have you had contact with the prosecution team? When was the first time you talked to them? In probably January of 2020. Okay. And how many times since January of 2020 have you had contact with the prosecution team? Your Honor, I'm going to object. I don't know what this has to do with that document. Your Honor, under rule, Idaho Criminal Rule 16B6, the state is required to uh, give me a summation of whenever they speak to a witness, what the things that are said within that uh, uh, meeting, and if she's had meetings with the prosecution uh, that we are not privy to and that we have not been given uh, 
access to or summations of. We've objected to those in the past. Uh, the state has provided some uh, on other witnesses, but I don't believe we've gotten any on Ms. Woodcock. It's a violation of Rule 16, Discovery. Has there been a specific written request made by the defense? No, because we didn't know they were having continuing contact. Under 16 v. 6, they are required to do that. Well, the rule starts off on written request of the defendant. That's why I'm asking if there's a written request. Oh, absolutely, yes. There is a written, there is a written request. And that's just going to witness lists. Uh, the state's included this witness. Oh, thank you. All right, I've reviewed the rule. What's the state's response, Mr. Wood? Thank you, Your Honor. The rule does not require we provide a summation of every conversation we have with a witness. The rule requires that we disclose if they make any statements to the prosecutor or to law enforcement. Any statements of this witness have been provided in reports, uh, in law enforcement reports. Uh, they've never made a statement to us other than what's included in those reports. And so the, the objection is unfounded. All right. Mr. Thomas, I'll allow you additional rebuttal if you'd like on the argument. No, Your Honor, I think the Rule 16b6 is clear that they were required to turn over any statements that the witness makes with the prosecution uh, or any of their agents. All right. I've reviewed the rule, Mr. Thomas. I'm going to overrule the objection, and that will be the ruling on that. In accordance with the rule, I think the state's indicated the rationale there, and you're allowed to ask if somebody's talked to the prosecutor before they've testified. That's generally part of cross-examination, but um, in terms of a requirement for some document that you think runs afoul of that rule, I don't see that here at this time, so the objection is overruled. Uh, with that in mind, then, um, why don't we have our lunch recess, and then we can continue with the questioning of this witness once we return back. So uh, we'll do our best. We want this to be as quick as possible, but understanding the logistics here as well. So uh, before 1 o'clock, if we can get restarted, that would be great. I'll check with the parties. I would like to shoot for resuming by no later than 1245, if possible, counsel. All right, we'll be on break for the lunch. All right. Uh, Your Honor, I just note that that document is still in the court's possession. It is. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wood. We'll hold that. Until Thank you. You can. You can return now. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, we're going to go back on the record now. This is case CR 22211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. We just completed the lunch break. There's been a uh, witness that's been placed under oath. We'll have continued testimony there before we bring the jurors in and recall the witness. Uh, I will state for a security concern for those in attendance, um, when we do have breaks, I'm advised that we're not going to permit you to leave personal effects, bags, et cetera, sitting on the benches when you exit the courtroom at any time because we have to keep track of any of those items, so they need to be there with you. Uh, and that's been a request for me from security, so please take your effects with you at any time that you exit the courtroom. I'll also note that the continuing conduct orders are in effect for both this courtroom and the viewing areas where this is being simulcast. And at this point, then, uh, we'll have all rise for the jury and have them brought in once they're here. And then we'll have the witness brought in. Yep.
Yeah, yeah Ms. Woodcock, if you come forward, we'll continue with your testimony. All right, thank you. Please be seated. All right, we're returning to uh, testimony here after the lunch break. I'll note that the Witness is testifying, Ms. Woodcock, you've previously been placed under oath and you are still under oath for continued questioning. There was an exhibit that was uh, held by the clerk at this time. It's been offered but not yet admitted, and I believe that was marked as State's Exhibit 1. Uh, Mr. Wood, if you'd like to continue your direct examination of this witness, you may. Could we quickly approach and have a real quick sidebar, Your Honor? Yes. Thank you. All right, Mr. Wood, you can inquire. Thank you. Your Honor, I had previously handed or had handed up to the court State's Exhibit 1, which is a self-authenticating document. Yes, the clerk has the Exhibit 1. No, thank you. Mrs. Woodcock, do you recognize that document? Yes. What is it? A Louisiana birth certificate for Kane and Todd Trahan. Okay, and what is the birth date on that document? May 25th, 2012. Okay, and where was, uh, where is the birthplace? Lake Charles, Louisiana. And who were the listed parents? Dennis Todd Trahan and Mandy Nicole Leger. Okay. Your Honor, I'd ask that that be published for the jury. Any objection? There no objection, Judge. All right. The exhibit may be published to the jury. Before it's being published, just to clarify, it's been offered. I don't think it's yet been admitted. We probably ought to cross that bridge before it's published. We have no Thank objection you. to the admission, Judge. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, and let me make sure the record picked that up. There was a note from defense counsel. There's no objection to the admission. So that's admitted as what I believe is marked as State's Exhibit 1. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, Exhibit 1's been admitted.
You know, I'm not sure why the uh, projectors it works. isn't working. We had it going a minute ago. Mrs. Woodcock, is that the, to your knowledge, is that the birth certificate that was received uh, when Canaan was first born? Yes. Thank you. Your Honor, the state would ask to hand the defendant State's Exhibit 2, it's another self-authenticating document. Um, while it is the document itself, the state did uh, prepare a courtesy copy for court and counsel. All right, the witness can be handed the exhibit and I'll review the courtesy copy. Council, I'm going to have a court personnel assist you a little bit with the projector and the lighting on that. Okay. okay. Mrs. Woodcock, do you recognize that document? Yes, there's nothing on the screen. I mean, this one? Yes, the document you're holding. <laughs> right. Yes, I recognize it. Uh, what? What is that? A uh, final decree of adoption. Okay. Your Honor, well, that's a self-authenticating document. I'd ask that it be uh, admitted into evidence. Any objection? No objection. Okay. Is that State's Exhibit 2? Yes, and if I could get that copy, I'll put it on the screen for the witness and the jury. May I publish it to the jury, Your Honor? You may. Exhibit 2 has been admitted. May we get that courtesy copy that the state indicated that they had? I yes. handed it to the bailiff. Never get This is what you previously testified that was a decree of adoption, correct? Yes. Uh, who is the adopted child on that? Kane um, uh, and Todd Trahan. And who are the um, adoptive parents? Uh, Charles Charles Vallow. I can't find his name right at this moment. Charles Vallow and Lori Vallow. Okay. And do you know when that document was uh, signed? July 25th, 2014. Thank you. Does the bailiff want to take this as it's committed in evidence? Your Honor, the state has another self-authenticating document to hand to the witness. This has been marked State's Exhibit 3. Is that the original? Can I take a look at the original? Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Woodcock, do you recognize that document? Yes, a Louisiana birth certificate. Okay. A Louisiana birth certificate. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, well, that's a self-authenticating document. I'd ask that it be admitted into evidence. Any objection? 
No, Your Honor. All right, Exhibit 3 has been admitted. May I publish it to the jury? You may. This is Woodcock. You stated that was a birth certificate? Yes. Your Honor, with the lighting on that, Elmo, if it's all right, I'll just have the bailiff hand this back to the witness. It's impossible to read with the glare. Okay. Can you state again what that document is? A Louisiana birth certificate. Who is it for? Joshua Jackson Vallow. And who are the listed parents? Leland Charles Anthony Vallow and Lori Noreen Cox. Okay. Thank you. Your Honor, I'd ask that what's been marked as State's Exhibit 4 be handed to the witness. Courtesy copy for the court and defense. Very well. Mrs. Woodcock, do you recognize that document? I do. What does it purport to be? Our beautiful grandson, JJ. Is that a, did you take that picture? I did. Is that a true and accurate representation of JJ Vallow? Yes. Your Honor, I ask that State's Exhibit 4 be entered in evidence. Any objection? May I vote here in aid of an objection? You may. Ms. Woodcock, you indicated that you were the one who took this photograph? Yes. Do you know when you took it? Probably, he was probably, probably five or six then, maybe seven. He was, he was probably, hang on, let me look. I can't remember exactly when. We took a lot of pictures of him. Where was it taken? In my husband's pickup truck. And, I mean, I guess, like what city? Lake Charles, Louisiana. And who else was there when this photo was taken? Well, it looks like the angle I took it from was the front passenger seat, so Larry was probably with us. Okay. You don't have any specific recollection of the day you took this? No, but this has always been one of my favorite pictures of him. Okay. Your Honor, I have no objection to the admission of State's Exhibit 4. All right. Exhibit 4 is admitted. Your Honor, may I publish it for the jury? You may. Mrs. Woodcock, who is that, again, who is that a picture of? J.J. Okay. Is this the J.J. that we have been speaking about this morning? Yes, it is. Okay. Mr. Wood, just to clarify our exhibits here, I'm holding a courtesy copy, but it's got what looks like the State's Exhibit sticker original. I want to make sure I don't have the original exhibit, not a copy. I think you do have the original, Your Honor. Okay. Let's go ahead and sort those out. So I'll hand you my copy, and I'll ask the bailiff to bring me the other back. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Mrs. Woodcock, you, before we broke for lunch, you had testified about Charles Anthony Vallow. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Charles Vallow dying and trying to make contact with JJ, correct? Yes. At any time did, after the death of Charles Vallow, did you become concerned about the whereabouts of JJ? Yes. Why? Because Lori didn't want him anymore. Were there any other reasons you were concerned about his whereabouts? I didn't know. I was having trouble reaching Lori and, and her keeping in touch. Blood does keep in touch with him. Okay. Did you ever reach out to law enforcement about your concerns about JJ? Yes. When did you do that? Um, my brother died on July 11th, and we found out about it July the 12th. And we were in Lake Charles, and he was deceased in Arizona in a Chandler. And we found out Friday afternoon, that was on the 12th, and then we talked to a detective then. And Larry and I flew out the next day to Phoenix so we could meet with the detective. And he was... He met with us the next day, that Sunday afternoon, and our first con question to the detective was, we are so worried about J.J., and, and also, did he see what happened to his dad? So did you, so you spoke with law enforcement very soon after your brother's death? Yes. After you first spoke with law enforcement, you did um, have occasion to FaceTime with JJ as you testified earlier, correct? Yes. After your last FaceTime with JJ on August 10th, uh, did you ever speak with law enforcement again about JJ's well-being or, or his uh, whereabouts? Yes, numerous times. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, did at this point, I'm going, <clears throat> I'm going to renew my objection. So to uh, Idaho Criminal Rule 16b-6, uh, she's indicating that she met with law enforcement on numerous occasions. I've not received, uh, and I've received some, but I don't think I've received all of those communications. Response? Your Honor, uh, he, the defense has received multiple reports, um, and I think that those would indicate all of the, the witnesses' statements about, about her concerns about J.J. All right. I considered the record that I've got on the issue and looking at the rule cited 16b-6, I'll overrule the objection. Mrs. Woodcock, did you take any steps yourself to try and locate J.J.? Yes. What did you do? Um, we hired a private investigator in October because we had not heard from J.J. since August 10th. We heard that Lori had left the state with JJ, and we had no idea where she was. Okay. Or he was. Okay. I want to speak with you about November in 2019. Was JJ Vallow ever physically with you in November of 2019? No. You had testified earlier that you were helping your brother Charles with his business, correct? Yes. And you had access to uh, multiple of his uh, financial records? Yes. And other accounts? Yes. Okay. Uh, did anything happen in November that alerted you to Lori Vallow's whereabouts? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you recall what date that happened? November 8th. Where were you? At home, Lake Charles. In Lake Charles, okay. Uh, how did you become aware of Lori Vallow's whereabouts? I had a printer that was Charles's. Um, when we cleaned out his house in Houston, uh, one of his sons and, and my family went to pack it up to vacate the house and um, no, nobody wanted the printer so I said okay I'll take it home and it sat on my table for a couple of months and 
on November the 7th, I decided it was time to hook it up to my computer. And I was having trouble with the scanner, so I was quite aggravated with it. So I went to bed and left it alone to look at it with a fresh eye in the morning. And I woke up at 4.30 in the morning, and I just had to go. Something was telling me to go work on that scanner. And when I got to my computer, I noticed that if you have Gmail, there's a, when you log on, there's a whatever icon you want it to be in the top right of your screen. And I saw Tr Charles's icon his for his Gmail in, in a, on my computer screen, so I, I, I don't know how it was there, but it was there. And so I clicked on it, and it brought me to his Gmail to sign in. And Did you, were sorry. you able to sign into that Gmail account? Yes. Did you have access to Charles's passwords? Yes, I, he had three favorite passwords, and um, uh, the first one I used worked. And had he provided you those passwords? Yes. Okay. Um, when you opened up that Gmail account, what did you see? I, there was a bunch of emails, but one that stuck out specifically was an Amazon, like a delivery status, delivery of like an order status email. Okay. Where, uh, where was that delivery to? It was to 575 Pioneer Road, apartment 175 in Rexburg, Idaho. Do you recall the date of that delivery? It was uh, probably a couple of days before November 8th. I don't remember specifically. Okay. But it was after July 11th, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and that delivery, was that associated with a specific company? It was uh, with Amazon. Okay. Uh, what did you do after you saw that notification? I called uh, Brandon Boudreaux was first, and then um, then law enforcement. And I do believe I talked to our private investigator as well. I talked to numerous people that day regarding it because I was shocked at what I found. Okay. Uh, did you look further... Um, into that Amazon account? Yes, I got into the browsing history in the Amazon account and I saw um, that there was browsing for a, a beach wedding dress, um, a, a, a bathing suit, uh, men's large size, I think it was large, um, white linen top and pants um, and malachite wedding rings and there were a couple other little odd and things i believe maybe flip-flops or something was there a date associated with that browsing history that you saw yes what date was that october 2nd of what year 2019 uh, was there a reason that caught your attention yes because i learned i had learned uh, before that, that Tammy Daybell had passed away on October the 19th, and and this was her looking at wedding rings and wedding stuff oh, on October I'm going to stop you there. Sorry. Um, when you said she was looking at wedding rings, who do you who did you believe was looking at wedding rings? Lori. Okay. Um. And was there anything else about that, that browsing history that, that uh, caused you concern or caught your attention? Uh, not thinking of anything else. Okay. Um, no. Did you become aware at any time that the Rexburg police were looking for JJ? Yes. Uh, did, did you ever meet with the Rexburg police? I met with them in January of 2020. Okay. Did you ever go to Rexburg, Idaho? Yes. Prior to um, this situation, had you ever heard of Rexburg, Idaho? Never. 
did you put out a reward uh, in aid of the search for JJ? Yes, at the uh, advice of a FD, FBI. Okay. Did you ever do interview? I'm going to object to relevance on that last uh, question. I'm going to ask that it be stricken for the record. Uh, well, the answer came before an objection was lodged, so it's not timely, so it's overruled. Did you ever do interviews with news outlets to publicize the search for JJ? Objection relevancy. What's the relevance, <coughs> Mr. Wood? Uh, just to lay the foundation of what uh, Mrs. Woodcock was doing looking for a missing child, Your Honor. The objections overruled. You can answer. When we went in January of 2020, the media had learned of the story of the, the kids missing and we reached out any every media outlet was all over this and we talked to every outlet we could. Um, we appeared on uh, talk shows. We did everything we could to raise awareness for the kids missing. Okay. Around this time, did you ever become aware if Lori Vallow had remarried? I did, um, yes. Do you know who she had married? Yes. Who was that? Chad Daybell. So you testified you went to Rexburg in January of 2020. Yes. Did you ever see JJ there? No. Were you ever informed that JJ and Tylee were found? Yes. When was that? June 9, 2020. Do you know where they were located? Yes. Where were they located? In Chad Daybell's backyard, buried in shallow graves. Okay. Your Honor, the state has no further questions at this time. All right, thank you, Mr. Wood. Let's make sure we've got all the <clears throat> exhibits that were admitted the court clerk, and then Mr. Thomas, you can conduct your cross-examination. How are you doing today? Good. So when uh, when JJ was born, this was this was your son, right? That, that he was born to. Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, your son uh, couldn't take care of JJ uh, due to personal issues, right? Correct. Okay. And then he came into your custody. Yes. Uh, and you were kind of like you, were, I guess not kind of like you were a foster parent, right? A uh, caregiver. Caregiver. Yes. Sort of like a foster parent, or I don't know how it works in Louisiana. Temporary placement. Okay. Um, and generally, um, what my understanding is, and what, what we do here in Idaho, is we try to reunite with the parents. Is that what was going on with, with uh, JJ? Yes. Okay. Um, and you kept him, I believe you said, from July until about February. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And sometime... Between July and February, there was a conversation between you and your brother Charles, right? Yes. About about the adoption or the possible adoption of JJ. Yes. And Charles is your older brother? Yes. He's about five years older than you? Yes. Okay. Um, and tell me again why it is that you didn't want to adopt uh, JJ. We really wanted to adopt JJ, and we could have provided him a good home. But when speaking with Charles and Lori, they just had a their atmosphere was is, was a lot more conducive to a baby. Um, uh, he was. 
he had uh, issues, uh, Canaan. I, I call him Canaan when we had him and mm-hmm. JJ after, so if I use either, sure. that's the difference. Um, so with Canaan, <clears throat> in Lake Charles, there were no special schools for children with disabilities. Mm-hmm. And that we knew that was going to be a concern at some point. Um, uh, Lori and Charles just seemed to have the the right um, the right. They had the right. Let me see. Okay, let me back up. Although Charles was five years older than me, mm-hmm. Charles could run circles around a twenty-five-year-old. Okay, and because Lori was, I believe, 17 years younger than him. So the age in that aspect didn't matter. And my husband, Larry, at that time was 65. And um, and we knew how how much, you know, raising children because he has four and I had two. And we knew that it was going to be a lot. And. His brother, Larry's brother, is raising was raising an autistic grandchild, and um, that it just the atmosphere that we had to offer in ways of you know stimulating a kid, bringing them to the park, or or, or going out with their friends, or him having friends over, um, just things like that. We just Lori and Charles is just ha- seemed to have a better place place they were a better placement for him right okay and what you wanted was the best thing for for Kanan or JJ right that's what we thought yes okay um and you mentioned that Larry had a brother who was raising an autistic child JJ was, or Kanan or and or JJ they were also autistic correct I don't think he was diagnosed at that time but he he did have disabilities <laughs> okay but you learned later that JJ did was diagnosed with autism. Yes. Okay. Um, you talked a little bit on the uh, with the prosecution attorney, prosecuting attorney, about you working with Charles when he uh, had a split with with Lori, right? Yes. And that happened. Uh, his split. At, he filed for divorce in February of 2019. You remember that? Yes. And that's when you flew out to uh, to Chandler. Yeah, it was it was before you filed, I believe, but it was right at that time. Okay, All right. Um, but he ended up uh, pulling that back or, or or quashing that that suit, right? Yes. So they they were going to get back together. Charles was hoping, but Lloyd was nowhere around. Okay, and that was in February. Yes, he okay. just. Couldn't go through with it at that at that time. And at that time, um, Charles had had uh, taken JJ with him to to Houston, right? At the end of March, yes. The end Actually, of March. Okay. Yes. Is that right? Yes, but Lori did pop back up like March 28th. It was we were in the middle of packing him to move, and she came walking in the house like. She hadn't been gone, and she was yelling at Charles to, you know, why did you take JJ, and what are you doing, and why are you moving, and just, it was ridiculous. It was, anyway, yes. Mm. And you recorded that conversation? I did. Yeah. Um, And that was a private conversation between Lori and and her husband at the time? Yeah. Okay. I mean, well, I don't know. I was in the in the next room. Her friend Melanie Gibb was right. in the next room, and we could all hear it. You were in the kitchen, yeah, right. And they were in in another room. They were right there in the dining room. Okay. Um, and so, so Charles ended up moving to Houston, right? Yes. Okay. And you said um, that uh, Lake Charles wasn't a good place for the schools that that J.J. would need to be in, and so that it was decided that, that he was going to live in Houston because that was a better place for him? Correct. And you said that uh, since Charles had to work a lot, you were going to go to uh, Houston to watch J.J. while Charles was off on business trips and whatnot? 
Yes, or we would get them and bring them home to just whichever, whatever worked best for us. Okay. And how far was it from Houston to, or, or not Houston, Katy, Texas, right? That's where they lived? Yeah, 150 miles. 150 miles? Yeah. If Google says that it took about six hours would that, would that to drive it, would that make any sense to you? No. No? How long did it take to drive it? An hour, uh, two and a half hours. Two and a half hours? Yeah. Okay. And that's to go from Lake Charles all the way through Houston and to the other side where Katie, Katie. was? Katie. When 150 miles, Houston is about 80 miles around. It's huge. Mm-hmm. And um, so 150 miles was like to a major airport or... In the general vicinity, yes, Katie may have been another 10 or 20 miles, but regardless, two and a half hours, depending on what time of day you went. So when you drove it, it took you about two and a half hours to drive it? Yes. Oh, okay. Right. And you indicated that, um, that the state asked you, or uh, Mr. Wood asked you, about when you became, why you became concerned about the whereabouts of JJ, and you said because Lori didn't want him anymore. Is that right? Did you remember yes. saying that? Yes. Okay. And what led you to believe that Lori did not want JJ anymore? <clears throat> because when a mother leaves their child, she left her husband and she left her child for 58 days, and I know it was 58 days because Charles counted every day and would tell me every day. Um, she never reached out to JJ. She didn't reach out to Charles. And, um. And were you, were you with them the entire 58 days? I was with them a lot of the 58 days. Out of 58 days, I probably was with them well over a month. So more than 30 days? Yes. And during those 30 days, you didn't hear from Lori? No. Okay, but you're not aware of times that she may have called and talked to Charles or JJ between that time that you weren't there. You don't have any specific knowledge, right? Not that he told me, no. Okay. May I say something? No, ma'am, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. uh, you know, I, I just Mr. Wood will be able to, be able to okay. re, re, uh, redirect you. Something interesting, on November the 8th, you indicate that you had packed up uh, Charles's house previously and nobody wanted the printer, and so you took the printer back to your house. You recall that? Yes. And then you said that you were having trouble with the scanner portion of it, um, and so you just went to bed. Yes. And then you woke up at 4.30 in the morning and... Uh, what, what was that like? Tell me a little bit about that. Was that a, what, what kind of an experience was that? It was, it was weird because I never woke up at 4.30 in the morning. Mm-hmm. And uh, for me to wake up at 4.30 in the morning with, with that scanner on my mind and having to get that, that was really weird because I never worried about anything that much. But it was bothering me, I guess. So I think it was divine intervention because of what I found when I logged on, when I got everything hooked up and sure what do, what do you mean by divine, by divine intervention what do you mean just God's hand thank you no further questions all right thank you Mr. Thomas Mr. Wood do you have any redirect of the witness the state has no further questions, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. That'll conclude your testimony. Thank you. you may go ahead and return down to your seat there in the gallery. We'll give you a moment to do that, and then I'll ask the state if they've got another witness. All right, Mr. Wood, the state can call its next witness. Your Honor, the state calls Brandon Boudreau. And 
who will be conducting direct examination? I will, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Smith. All right, thank you, Mr. Boudreau. If you'll come around this way and be seated in the seat to my left. All right, just a few quick instructions. We're making a record of the case, so please make verbal responses to any questions. Say yes or no instead of shaking your head, for example. Please try to avoid talking at the same time anyone is questioning you. And with that in mind, Ms. Smith, you can inquire. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Can you introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the grand jury, please? Yeah, my name is Brandon Boudreau. I'm from Mesa, Arizona. Okay. Sir, could you spell your last name, please? B-O-U-D-R-E-A-U-X. Okay. Mr. Boudreau, are you married? I am. How many times have you been married? Twice. Okay. Let's... Sure. Sorry. Okay. And I think it'll help if you just lean just a little forward. It might be a little uncomfortable, but lots of people need to hear. Okay. All right. And you said you'd been married twice. Let's talk about your first marriage. Who were you married to? Melanie Cope at the time she became Boudreau. Okay. And with your marriage to Melanie Boudreau, did you have any children? I did. How many? Four. Okay. And what are their ages? I have Braxton, who is 13, Brighton, who's nine, Blake, who's seven, and Breeze, who just turned six. Okay. How long were you married to Melanie? A little over 10 years. Okay. What year did you marry? 2008. Okay. During that time, did you meet her family? I did, yes. Okay. Can you tell us who you remember or who you had relations with? I mean, she has a big family, so her mom passed away when she was young. So I met her birth mom's family, her dad's family, and then her stepmom's family. When you say her birth mom's family, what are their names? The Coxes. Okay. And if you could just scooch just a little closer. Thanks. Yeah, sorry. I know. It's all right. And so the Coxes, what are their names, please? Barry and Janice Cox are her, that'd be her grandparents. And then Adam Cox, Summer Shifflett, Lori Vallow, and Alex Cox. Okay. And those four people are who to Melanie and therefore were to you? They would be her aunts and uncles. Okay. Therefore, your aunts and uncles and in-laws. Yeah. Okay. Did you spend much time with Lori's aunts and uncles? I mean, Melanie's aunts and uncles? Yes. We, before we got married, I met them in Arizona. And we would spend, you know, most holidays together. We would, when I first, right after I was married, I moved down to Arizona. I actually lived with Lori for a while and her husband, Charles. Okay. So when you say Lori, do you see the person you recognize and knew through marriage as Lori Vallow here in the courtroom today? Yeah, I do. Okay. Can you please point her out and describe an item of her clothing? She's sitting over on my right with glasses on. Okay. Your Honor, may the, what table? Just so that the record's real clear. The second table. Okay. How many people are at it? There's three. Okay. Your Honor, may the record reflect he's identified the defendant, please? Yes, that's reflected now on the record. Thank you. Now, you said you'd spent time in Ms. Vallow's home with Charles, correct? Yes. All right. And at that time, was he her husband? Yes. All right. How well did you get to know them? 
Um, very well. You know, we we uh, just spent a lot of time together. Okay. When you say we, the, what does that mean? Uh, me and my family. My, okay. My wife of the, at the time and my children. Okay. Um, and um, did you get to know her children, uh, Ms. Vallow's children? Yeah, I did. Okay. Um, what were their names? Um, there's Colby, Tylee, and JJ. Okay. Um, and uh, um, when you uh, say you got to know them, did your kids also interact with their cousins? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we did. We um, They spent a lot of time together. Um, my oldest, Braxton, was well, pretty close with JJ. Um, I think, uh, you know, JJ uh, looked up to him a lot. And, um, and they, um, they spent a lot of time together. Okay. Um, so would they spend any time, time in each other's homes? Yeah. Um, you know, JJ wasn't, uh, he wasn't super interactive as, a, as you know, he had autism, so he wasn't always like incredibly interactive, but um, he seemed to love hanging out with my kids and specifically uh, Braxton and Brighton. Um, as he got older, he started to be able to interact a little more and he would always, um, he kind of had two fascinations. One was with um, traveling. We always, he always said everybody always got him suitcases. He had suitcases everywhere. Um, and, and the other was coming and hanging out with, with Braxton. He would always ask for that. And, um, and they had a great time when they, when they spent time together. Okay. And what about Tylee? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I did. I spent a lot of time with Tylee as well. Um, I watched her grow up. I met her when she was just little and then, um, got to watch her kind of grow into a teenager. Um, did you have any um, special sort of religious connection to Tylee? Yeah. Um, uh, in, in our church, when you uh, turn eight, uh, you can get baptized if you choose. And um, so when she turned eight, she decided to get baptized. And um, for whatever reason, Charles wasn't comfortable doing the baptism. And so uh, they had asked me, and I, I, of course, said yes. I would be honored to baptize her. And you say in your church, um, what church is that? What's your faith? Um, I go to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Okay. And was Tylee baptized into that church? She was, yes. Okay. Um, were you and your wife uh, members of the um, Church of Latter-day Saints? Yeah, we were. Okay. Um, and to your knowledge, what about Mr. and Mrs. Vallow? Yes, as well. Okay. Um, did you, um, what about the relationship sort of between, that you observed between Melanie Boudreau and, uh, Lori Vallow? What was that like? Yeah. Um, you, you know, Melanie, uh, she kind of had like a, an affinity towards, uh, Lori. She, um, she always kind of. Um, she, she looked at her, uh, kind of less like an aunt figure and almost more like a mom figure. She, she was always, um, wanting to be like her. Um, did you get along with Charles? Yeah. Yeah. Really well. Um, Charles and I both, uh, had a passion for sales and, and business and, um, we connected well in that. And, um, you know, we just. Uh, both loved our families, and so it was very easy for us to spend time together. Um, so it wasn't uncommon that the Boudreaux and the Vallows would get together and get along? Yeah, we would, you know, there was years where they lived by us, and we would usually see each other maybe once a month or more. Um, and then there was times when they lived further away, um, but we would travel to each other's homes, stay in each other's homes when we went, and it wasn't uncommon to spend a week, you know, or more at, at each other's homes. Um, did you spend holidays together? Yes. Okay. Um, what was the last Christmas that the Boudreaux and the Vallow spent together? Um, that would have been in uh, 2018. Okay. Was that a typical Christmas um, for the two couples? No, it was. Uh, it was definitely different at that point. Why? 
Um, when you get really close with people, um, you kind of become comfortable and you let your guard down and you, um, you know, your body language is more relaxed and more comfortable and it, and it just, everything kind of, I don't know how to, you know, it, it can be so fluid. You can see each other and, and pick right up where you left off. Um, but everybody feels like they know everything about each other, almost like it's just, you, you know, you're, you're so, you know each other so well that it's, it's like memory, um, if you will. But, um, and, and that one, um, it, it was very, well, there was, there was, uh, Melanie Gibb who was there, who I'd never met before, um, and never heard anything about, um, and, um. So let me stop you there and let me ask. So you said it, it wasn't the same as before. Were there other people there for this holiday? Yeah. Um, yeah. The, Melanie Gibb was there with her family. Um, who I didn't, I, I didn't really know her. And, and the rest of us were all, um, uh, it just, it just didn't feel, we didn't feel close. The body language was very, um, in, in the way that the conversations flowed and everything just felt very distant. Now, around this time, um, were you and your wife active in your church or in your ward? Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, had you been um, active with the Valos in your faith? Could, could you maybe expand on that? Sure. Had you and the Valos shared that faith? And shared actives, shared activities at church. Um, yeah, we we definitely um, had had done things at church together. Okay. Um, and did your wife's and or Mrs. The, let's take it one at a time. Did your wife's activity in um, religious um, events increase around this time, around that Christmas? Yeah, um, a little bit before it actually, but. Um, can you tell us about that? Yeah. Um, so, so when we first got married, um, my my wife's kind of religious level was was kind of low. She didn't enjoy going to church. It wasn't something that she. Uh, it was it was more me pushing going to church. Uh, I, I felt like I got like a little bit of um, a benefit from it, and she didn't really enjoy it that much. And so, for most of our marriage, it was kind of me pushing going to church. Um, but kind of in the fall of that year. When you, we're talking 2018. Yeah, sorry. In the, in the fall of 2018, um, she started getting really passionate about going to church and about different ideas within the church. Um, she started going to these things. She was calling firesides. When you say calling firesides, are firesides within the LDS faith? Are those a common practice? Um, so in, in the LDS faith, our... Um, the way we our, our setup is organized is um, our congregation is called a ward, and there's usually some leaders inside the ward, um, and then there's a bigger congregation called a stake, and um, in, inside of that, uh, usually ecclesi- ecclesiastical leaders um, organize uh, the regular Sunday events, but you also occasionally will have like um, we call them, they call them firesides, but like a special event that focuses on something around our our belief. Um, and in this case, um, so the, in the fire, were the events that your wife attending called firesides sort of part of the organized part of your church? No. And that, and that's, I guess what started kind of, um, sticking out to me was, uh, she, she would go to these things that she was calling firesides, but they weren't put on by the church. They didn't have any ecclesiastical connection. Like there wasn't any, anything like that, but they were using that term, um, and um, she was coming home with kind of different ideas of what she was going to do to to be a faithful member of the church. Okay. Um, um, was the defendant at some of these firesides? Um, yes. Okay. Um, did Charles go to any of these fireside talks? No, not not that I'm aware of. Okay. And and were you invited? Uh, no, I had a discussion with uh, Melanie, and she told me that um, these were her thing and she didn't want me to go and it was very clear that I wasn't welcome to come. To your memory, who was attending some of these, you know, extra church activities? Um, 
besides Melanie and Lori. Is that besides asking? Melanie and Lori. Your Honor, I'm going to object. It sounds like he doesn't have information as to who was there. Uh, it w- any information that he would have gotten would have been hearsay. I'll sustain that. I think there's okay. an adequate foundation. Okay. Um, were you aware of who attended some of these events? Um, not, uh, not in the present, but afterwards, yes. Okay. Did any of the people who later went to those told you they had attended those? Um, yeah, I had a conversation with Melanie Gibb later where she told me she went to those. Okay. Again, it's hearsay. And that will be stricken as hearsay, the okay. statement of what another said. All right. But you weren't allowed to go to these talks. Correct. All right. Um, and when you say some of the ideas your wife came back with, um, did they center around particular topics? Um, yeah, the the things that were uh, she she felt a need um, to go to the temple every single day, um, which um, is a little bit extreme. And in, in, like in our faith, we believe in going to the temple, and I think regular attendance can be good. It's it's um it's something where you you go and kind of. Uh, practice ritualistically like uh, your, your faith and, and show God that you are trying to keep promises to him. Um, and, and so it's a good thing to do. But um, it's, Is it unusual to go every single day? Very. And, and, and it got even more extreme. Like she would have to go during like um, our family trips to Disneyland or things like that that just were uh, very, very overwhelming. Um, she had to focus on um, on on this idea that like the world could end soon and we needed, we had a, we had a disagreement about buying $10,000 worth of food storage right away. Um, th- things that just seemed, uh, extreme. Okay. Um, and so in, um, in this situation, you've been to Christmas and your wife is participating in these, these extra religious events. Did, um, the situation, but did that affect the situation between sort of the Boudreaux's and the Vallos going into 2019? Um, yeah, I guess, I guess, um, it got, it got a little bit, um, harder for us. Um, why? Excuse me. Um, do you need some water? Yeah, yeah, actually. I would. Do you mind if, Your Honor, if he takes a second? Not at all. It's there for the witness. Thanks. Can you ask me that question again? Um, in going into 2019, did the situation between the Boudreaux and the Vallos was it affected by this religious activity or the the sort of atmosphere at Christmas? Um, yeah, it just kind of got more bizarre. Um, at, at, in, in the 2019, the um, in January we. Uh, Got a, a a call and text messages from from Lori and Charles that um, Lori was uh, accusing him of cheating and infidelity. Okay, um, how did you respond to that situation? Um, well, it was kind of complicated. Uh, Why? For me, well, because um, initially when when all this started happening, you know, I, I wasn't. Really, like I, I wasn't even aware of it that the night that it happened, um, uh, and um, when I became aware of it, it, it just seemed odd. Um, you know, there there was um, it, it seemed kind of like it just went from zero to hundred really quick. Like uh, Lori had removed all the money from their account. She had. Um, so let me let me let me stop you there and break it up. So did the situa- did that affect the situation with your family? Yeah, it did. Um, my my wife was very adamant that we were going to take sides. Um, and did you respect um, Melanie's wishes on that? Yeah, I did my best. Yes. Okay. Um, and did there come a time um, during this period that you would see um, Lori in the early late winter, early spring of two thousand nineteen? Um, I, I didn't see Lori very much at all, um, but I did see Charles. Okay. So, um, how often would you see Charles? Um, he, he would bring JJ over to play a couple times. Um, he, he, he had JJ, um, Lori wasn't, 
um, with JJ at the time. She, I don't know where she went actually. Um, uh, but, um, so Charles would come over to your house with JJ. Yeah. And, um, and so what would JJ do at the house? He would play with Braxton and, um, and just kind of get a release. J JJ was always, uh, very high energy. He had to like lock everything up when he came so that he couldn't get him get out of the house or get himself into trouble. So it'd be kind of thorough. Um, it was like having a really big um, kid that doesn't know how to like, you know, make certain decisions yet. Um, and so uh, it, was, it was a lot of work when he'd come over, but you know, you just loved him. So you, you did it. But um, so Braxton kind of always knew that his duty was to play with JJ and, and entertain him and keep him kind of busy so that um, he, he wouldn't, he would, he would get into less, you know, trouble or get into less things. Got it. And so did you spend time with Charles when JJ was there? I did, yeah. <clears throat> um, how? Um, let's fast forward to that um, that summer. Did you have occasion to um, go to a family a trip or visit your wife's family in Utah? Yeah, I did. Um, uh, so I um, after after um, meeting with Charles those couple times and um, kind of seeing him go through some painful process uh um I, I according as i promised melanie i kept asking him not to come over and you know, doing my best to help him but trying to create distance and so we we actually um that kind of that summer went out and uh, went to utah to my my wife's sister was going to get married and we were staying at my in-law's house okay um did anything unusual happen at your in-law's house um yeah um so my, um, this was in June, um, and, uh, to, to explain it, you know, my, on June 23rd, my grandfather, um, passed away of a heart attack. And, um, I got a little bit, uh, it was a, his health wasn't great, but it was still a surprise. And so, um, on the 25th, my mom called me to tell me about the funeral, um, and I had this conversation with Melanie where I told her when it was, and she told me she wasn't going to go to the funeral. She didn't want anything to do with it. And it created kind of a... A disagreement between you two? Yeah, yeah, a disagreement. Um, and in, in that process, this uh, what, I, what I thought we were arguing about with like her not wanting to go to my grandpa's funeral, not wanting my kids to go kind of escalated into something completely different and just kind of cascaded into a bunch of stuff that didn't make any sense and had nothing to do with me or okay. to do with this. All right. And when you say to do with this, um, did it lead to some accusations against you? Um, yeah. It, after I, after I, um, I took a little break after I felt so emotional about my grandpa. I walked for a while. I came back and I really wanted to break through and have like a, honest conversation with her. So I, I just came and apologized for my feelings and just told her that I would uh, accept her not going to my grandpa's funeral. And I just begged her to, um, talk to me about what was going on and why things were so hard. And she said that if I, um, if I was honest, then we could work through things. And she said, God had revealed some things to her. Um, and so I, I just said, let's talk about them. Like, what is it? What is it? What's between us? And she started out by accusing me of, um, of hacking her aunt Lori's computer. Um, had you hacked your aunt Lori, her aunt Lori's computer? No, no, okay. I don't know anything about hacking and, um, that was not something I did. Um, it was, it was really illogical, uh, which, which stuck out to me and, and frustrated me because I just, I didn't know why it had anything to do with what we were fighting about. Um, how did that conversation end? Um, it escalated some more, um, uh, hours and then I um I kept trying to talk through it with her um eventually I um her, her father got involved and we talked to him and I tried to she wouldn't talk to him with me but I talked to him and she was saying she didn't feel safe with me at the house and, and, and she accused me of um being a homosexual which is another thing that didn't make any sense but Charles had been telling me previously she was going to say okay he was going to convince her Okay, so she made those various accusations. How did how did it end? Um, it it ended with um, 
her going to sleep and um, me feeling kind of overwhelmed. And finally, I I, um, I texted Charles and Lori that I was frustrated with them, that I felt like this was on them. And Did you ever hear back from the defendant? Lori never answered or responded. Um, Charles talked to me. Did you, um, without getting into what somebody told you, what contact, what, what day was this? Uh, June 25th and in, in, in past midnight, so into the 26th. Okay. Um, did you have additional, uh, and that's 26th of June, correct? Yeah. Okay. Did you have additional conversations with Charles, um, in the following few days? I did. Um, I, uh, talked to him again after I, uh, kind of worked through some stuff with my with my dad and my ecclesiastical leader and I went to a counseling session I called him oh sorry with my dad um, with my ecclesiastical leader our, our bishop is what we call him and then um, and then I went to a counseling session um, just feeling a little overwhelmed and then I uh, called Charles that night and talked to him that was the last time I, I talked to him and just I felt kind of maybe like he was the only person who knew what I was going through because he'd gone through all these things earlier and um, just told him I'm sorry okay. for not being there. Because you'd kept your distance at your wife's request. Yeah. Okay. Um, you said that's the last time you talked to him. You didn't talk to him again before he died? No. Okay. After Charles died, did you have contact with uh, the defendant, Lori Vallow? Uh, no. Okay. After Charles died, did you have contact with JJ and Tylee? No. Okay. Um, how did it progress for you um, in your relationship with your wife? Um, did you eventually reconcile or did you divorce? No, we, we ended up divorcing. Okay. When did you divorce? Um, well, I, we... we did a mediated divorce, so we started the process after I got back from my grandpa's funeral. She uh, left. She just took our car home, so I took my kids and flew home. Um, on a, um, and when I when I got home, she let me know that we had to do a mediated divorce. We had to do a divorce, and so that would have been in July. I started um, going through the process, um, and so we. Uh, we met. With, I found a mediator after consulting some people and hearing that that would be the lowest conflict way to divorce. I tried to follow through with that, so we we went through that process and um, uh, that that started. Um, I, I can't say exactly which day, but one probably around the first of July. Okay. Um, and then, um, did you complete? Um, did you continue working on the divorce and separation through that summer and fall? I did, yes. Okay. Um, and where were you living in the end of September and beginning of October of 2019? Um, at, at the end of September, I was uh, selling my house, my home that we had bought together. I had moved uh, Melanie to a rental property. Um, and uh, then I, as soon as I sold my house, I got a rental property as well for the time being just to try to create some stability. I um, rented a property right back in where my old ward was, where I had lived before. Okay. Um, and so how how did that situation work out? Were you able to share custody? Um, I mean, it was complicated. She, uh, she was just so standoffish, so it was really hard for me to, like, when, when I was showing the house, she wouldn't we had agreed that I would go see my kids and that um, I could put them to bed each night, but she wouldn't actually let me in her home. She said she was scared of me. And so I, I didn't get a lot of time with my kids up until I sold my house, at which time I got my house ready really fast, my new home, um, so I could have my kids uh, in there. And um, Did there something occur at the beginning of October of 2019 that affected that situation? Yeah. What? Um, what? I, October 2nd, um, someone parked in front of my house and, and shot at me. Okay. What did you done that morning? You know, I'm going to object to relevancy. I don't know what this has to do with uh, the case at hand. May we approach? Side, yeah, a yeah. quick sidebar with the council on this issue.
All right, counsel, there's a ruling under advisement. The court's going to review some previous uh, research and rulings I've made in the case to determine this, so this will be the time we'll use for our mid-afternoon break. Uh, we are going to go till 3.30 today, so we'll try to keep this break to around 15 to 20 minutes to allow the jurors to break as well, and then we'll come back on the record with additional questioning. So everyone, please rise for the jury. All right. All right, thank you. We're going back on the record, case CR 22-211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. There's been an objection raised that relates to issues that have previously been brought before the court in motions in limine and motions by the state in regards to 404B evidence. Uh, the court finds it appropriate to take up a argument and ruling on the issue at this point outside of the presence of the jurors who have been excused for a mid-afternoon break, so uh, there was an objection raised by the defense. I'd like to hear the response from the state, and then I'll allow a rebuttal argument from the defense before making a ruling. I'll turn on my microphone. And um, the court wants a out in public our response in front of the witness? Yes. Okay. Um, they, um, happy to. Um, Your Honor, the state is believes that this is part of a common scheme and plan. Um, the defendant, um, with her co-conspirators, conspired to cause the death of multiple individuals in her world. She is charged specifically with the death of Tylee, JJ, and Tammy. She's charged with conspiracy on those issues. And um, the state's belief in the electronic evidence, the telephone evidence, the, I, the witness testimonies through those people who participated in these conversations clearly establish a conspiracy to remove individuals who were obstacles to her future life together with Chad Daybell and to remove obstacles to um, their plan for this life together. Um, the, um, the shooting of at at and killing of spouses of individuals who were part of this group was part of this common scheme or plan. The financial benefit to Ms. Vallow Daybell's niece at the death of her um, soon-to-be ex-husband um, help, would have helped finance some of the defendant's travels, lives, and uh, movement on in the future. Um, there will be multiple witnesses who discuss um, that uh, the, the, the defendant talked to people that Melanie Boudreaux and her money would take care of them, that Melanie Boudreaux and her money would help aid um, the group's plans for the future. And fundamentally, it is part of a common scheme or plan. It is far more probative than prejudicial. It is part and parcel. The other piece, just from logic in terms of the law enforcement involvement, the shooting at Mr. Baudreau is what actively got law enforcement paying attention, what actively got law enforcement looking for J.J. and Tylee, and it's core to the presentation of many of the law enforcement's assessments of evidence. All right. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Mr. Thomas, the response from your defense. Just uh, so that I understand, the state is indicating that this is part of a common scheme or plan and getting rid of spouses is part of the common scheme or plan. Judge, it seems like this is a stretch at best. We'd ask the court not to allow this uh, evidence in. It doesn't, uh, without further uh, foundation, through all of these other text messages and whatnot, Mr. Boudreau can be called after uh, some of these things come in to um, to testify, but I, at this point, I don't think it's appropriate to allow him uh, to testify about these things uh, without any more foundation. Your Honor, may, may I just briefly, you know, this is a chicken or an egg thing. I guarantee you if the state offered those other items, um, 
the the defense would be saying it's premature because we don't know what happened. And so in reality, we have the witness here. He had a relationship, and the state is abiding by the previous rulings of the court. We brought it to your attention in camera ahead of time. You've given us a, a ruling in limine, and we are following that ruling. All right. Well, uh, I do agree it is a chicken and an egg thing, as you mentioned, when looking at this evidence. Um, the court has to consider Rule 404B because it's premised on what may be presented in court. Generally, it's brought up outside the presence of the jury and also in advance of trial. The parties have complied with that procedurally. And so we did have a closed hearing relating to this 404B issue back in February of this year. And on February 22nd, the court issued an oral ruling uh, that as a preliminary matter, I would allow the evidence or not prohibit the evidence under Rule 404B and also made findings related specifically to uh, this particular witness and what is alleged to have occurred. Uh, I've considered whether or not the order of things should require more foundation before we go into it at this point, but I don't really see a better way uh, other than to admonish and caution the state that at this point I'll permit the 404B evidence to be admitted. Um, however, uh, at this stage of the proceedings, there's not really a record that goes into the common scheme or plan in the detail that you've indicated. However, there was a proffer made by the state at the previous ruling, and again, a proffer today that that evidence will be forthcoming. So I'll overrule the objection and allow the evidence. Uh, but the, I guess, danger for the state there is if sufficient evidence does not come in later to support the allegations that take this outside of 404B, then we may have an issue with the jury having heard this testimony. So uh, the court will rely on the proffers made today and previously in overruling that objection. And I'll allow this line of questioning based on that and my prior finding made at that February 22nd ruling that was briefed and argued by the parties before. So that'll be the court's decision on the evidentiary objection at this point. We'll now bring the jurors in. And just before I do that, I will advise and caution the witness here who, although you've heard a lot of legal argument here, you're still required to just uh, tell only what you know from your own personal experience uh, in answering these questions and could be subject to further objections if you go outside of that based on anything you heard here in legal argument. So with that in mind, that's the court's ruling at this time. Uh, we'll have the jury returned, and then you can continue your examination, Ms. Smith. Thank you, Judge. Mr. Boudreau, do you have water up there? Okay.
All right, thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. All right, Ms. Smith, you can continue your questioning. I'll remind the witness you're still under oath. Um, Mr. Boudreau, you were telling us uh, about um, being shot at on October 2nd of 2019. Do you yes. remember that? All right, um, let's back up. Where'd you, where'd you been that morning? Um, I had my kids, so when we woke up, I got them ready for school. Um, my two uh, older kids were in elementary school, so I dropped them off at, at their school. Um, my, my third youngest uh, went to a daycare preschool, and then I dropped my very youngest off at their mom's house, Melanie. M Melanie Boudreaux's home? Yes. Okay. Um, now, uh, what did you do after that? Um, after that, I uh, drove to the, my gym where I worked out. Okay. And um, this occurred down in Arizona, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and then what did you do after going to the gym? Did you head home? Yeah, so I left the gym and I drove home as I was driving home. Um, I lived on the second house in um, off of, I would make a left-hand turn onto my street, and I was the second house in. Okay, let me ask you, how long had you lived in that home? Only a few days. I, um, Like I said, I sold my house previously, um, and in a rush to get make sure that I got my kids um, that, that coming um, weekend, I um, had uh, just moved everything myself, and, and then two of my neighbors noticed me moving. Uh, I just taken. So let me let me just stop you there. How long had you lived at that house? Only a few few days. Okay. And while you were at that, how who knew you lived at that house? Um, maybe maybe five people. Okay. And who were those five? Um, my neighbors who helped me move, and uh, Melanie, who I had to tell. Okay. Um, so you're heading home that morning, and you turn on the street. What happens next? Um, as I came around the corner. Um, I noticed there was a Jeep parked right in front of my driveway. Um, my driveway would have been, um, like this and the Jeep was just parked right directly in front of it. Um, and, uh, as I, as I was starting to drive towards it and I would have had to make a left hand turn into it, I, um, I noticed a few things that stood out to me. The first was that it but was, what were the things that you noticed? Oh yeah. Um, I noticed that it was parked really closely, um, almost touching the, the van that had been parked there the previous several days. Um, it had a Texas license plate and, uh, it, the Jeep, it was a Jeep Wrangler and Wranglers have a, a, um, a tire on the back of them and there was no tire on this one. Instead, the window was kind of hanging, uh, open, but like the, the little tab things were like sitting on the outside of it. Okay. Um, so you, you see those things about the Jeep. What happens next? Um, as, as I drove forward, the window came up and I saw a, a gun with what looked like a silencer. Um, I heard a bang and my driver's side window shattered. Um, and so my natural re reaction, instead of turning left into my driveway, um, I, I drove an electric car, so it was very instant, but I just pushed the gas and it just shot me forward. Okay. Um, what happened after your car, your window is shot out? Um, I continue to drive, and, and when you, um, when you, when you're in a, a Tesla, the, the electric car, you let your foot off the gas, it, it, it breaks. And so, I remember when I hit it, my phone flew forward, um, and then as I kind of came around the corner, I remember letting my foot off, and it came back, grabbed my phone, I called nine one one. I went around the corner, and I parked next to. Um, the public pool there for a second. Um, and then I remember as I was talking to the 911 person, I saw the Jeep 
come around the corner and I, I don't know what I was thinking, but I started to try to follow it. And, um, and then the, the person told me that was a bad idea. So I, or, or I thought it, I'm not a hundred percent sure which, but I, I went back over and, and they instructed me to park in front of my house. So I parked in front of my house and then police arrived. Okay. Um, did the, you give the police the information on that Jeep? I did. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And did you follow up with law enforcement down in Arizona? Um, yeah, after F. So, uh, so th- thanks. And so now my next, my next question is, um, did you take any steps after cooperating with law enforcement to, to identify that Jeep? I did. Yes. What did you do? Um, well, after, after it, it, you know, it took all day to go through like once this happened, but after a long amount of time, um, in the process, I had met with a detective and talked to him about just thoughts that I had about what was going on. He was just asking me, um, trying to, trying to get a handle on it. And, um, as I was thinking about that, I realized that, um, Tylee had a Jeep that Charles had bought her with a Texas plate that looked exactly like that. And I knew the VIN number because Charles had given it to me. So I gave that to the police officer, to my detective. Okay. Um, what color was that Jeep? Um, it was a, a grayish green color. Okay. okay. And um, did the, the Jeep you saw had no tire on the back? Correct. Okay. Um, did you take any steps then also to provide it? Uh, I'm sorry, you told us you gave vi- the VIN to law enforcement? Forgive me. How did you get that VIN? Charles had given it to me previously. Why would he give you a VIN? Oh, I was a insurance agent at the time, and um, he had given it to me to run insurance across all of their different cars. Okay. Um, and so you provided that to law enforcement, correct? I did, yes. All right. Um, what other steps, if any, did you take to follow up on uh, that Jeep um, that you believe to be Tylee's Jeep and the shooting at you? Um, I had called and talked to... Um, uh, Adam Cox and Zach Cox, um, because they had also, um, had concerns about everything going on. And okay. Uh, other than talking to somebody, what other steps did you take? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, did you, um, look at any information on the internet? Uh, about the Jeep? Or following up on the shooting at you. Oh, yes. Yeah, I did. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, That's all right. Yeah, after, um, after my shooting, I um, started to have my beliefs about who I thought did it, and I got concerned about um, the situation. And so um, I started thinking back to um, previous stuff that had happened, uh, and I, I remembered that... Um, in these groups, there were people who I didn't know, but I remember there was a bunch of emails Charles had sent me. So I went through and reread those. Okay. And um, and did you see any names in the emails that you were looking at? When you say those groups, you're talking the groups of people that your wife was meeting in these firesides? Yeah. Yeah, she she was meeting a bunch of uh, people that didn't necessarily have, that were, said they were members of the church, but didn't have any, like, necessary connection to the church. <laughs> and, and in that process, some of them would, you know, write books or do things, and she would um, get into some of this stuff. Um, and I remember distinctly inside of these groups, there was uh, emails that were being sent with a, a, a group of them. Um, and so I just went back to look at the emails Charles had sent me from there, um, and, and, and most of them came from a Chad Daybell. And since I didn't know who he was, I started Googling his name. Okay. And um, in that process of Googling his name, what did you see? Um you know, I uh, I was just going through some of the things that were there, and I saw uh, uh, on uh, an obituary for a Tammy Daybell. Okay. Um, and after you saw that, um, did you take any steps to follow up on the, on what you saw? Yes. Um, it made me really uh, nervous because Charles. It. It's, let me ask you the question now. What steps did you take? Oh, sorry. Um, right. Because of how I was feeling, my nervousness, um, I reported it to law enforcement and told them that in my gut something felt wrong, and I just asked them to follow up. Okay. Now, um, at somewhere in here, did you learn that um, JJ and Tyler were missing? Yeah. Um, 
as as things progressed and I came to my opinion about who it was that shot at me, I started to um, try to be proactive and um, hoping to get information, doing whatever I could. And uh, in that process, um, we found out that um, no one had seen from uh, Tylee or JJ. Okay. Um, Your Honor, the state is going to ask the court for the mission of state's exhibit uh, number five. It has some additional stickers on it that, that aren't relevant to this hearing, but the sticker is on the back at state's exhibit five, which is a self, uh, self authenticating document, which is the birth certificate for Tylee Ryan showing a date of birth of 924, uh, 2002. And, Your Honor, we did not make extra copies of that. That because it's in an evidence envelope, I certainly can if the court wants. I've had an opportunity to review that, so um, all right. So to be clear, it, it is marked previously with <coughs> Exhibit Four stickers, but this is State's Trial Exhibit Five. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Would you show the witness? And just for the record, it, what does it that document reflect? Uh, it says Tylee Ryan. Your Honor, I'm going to object here. I don't think he has personal knowledge of what's what he's just. Anybody can just read the document. Well, and I understand the document. First of all, it's not been admitted yet. Oh, I apologize. Um, so let's figure out where we are with that. I apologize. I thought the court had admitted it. The state moved for the admission of State's Exhibit Five. Any objection? As to the document being, being admitted, a birth certificate, right. we have no objection to the fact that it's a birth certificate. Okay, so Exhibit 5 is admitted. And then uh, you can continue with your questioning now that it's been admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, on State's Exhibit 5, which has been admitted, um, what's the date of birth listed for Tylee Ryan? 9-24-2002. Okay. Um, your Honor, the state um, also at this time would offer to the court state's exhibit number six. Um, I would um, give an opportunity to both give it to the court and to um, ask the witness to look at it. Original on top, court copy underneath. I think again I have the I think I have the original now. I think they probably all have stickers, Judge. One should oh. say the word original on it. Okay, mine does not. So okay, good. The all right, thanks. Thank you. May I proceed, Judge? Yeah, it well again also this has been offered now but not yet admitted. Well, I was gonna have the witness identify it first, but I wanted to give it to you before I okay. did that. Go ahead. Okay. Um, do you recognize State's Exhibit Number Six? Yes, I do. Okay, what is it? Uh, it's a picture of Tylee from her Instagram. Okay, um, and uh, is it true and accurate picture of Tylee in her teenage years? Yeah. Okay, move for the admission of State's Exhibit Number Six. Any objection? Uh, may I uh, volunteer an aid? You may. <clears throat> you indicate that this is a photograph of Tylee. From her Instagram, is that right? Yes. Okay, and how do you recognize that? Um, I'm friends with her on Instagram. You're friends on Instagram with her? Yes. Okay. And um, you saw this pop up on your Instagram? Yes, I have. Okay. You didn't take the photograph? No, I did not. Okay. You don't know if it's been Photoshopped or, I mean, it looks like her, right? Yes. But you're not positive that uh, whatever's on the photograph or in the photograph is, is legitimate. You, just, you, don't, you weren't there when the photograph was taken. I was not there when this photograph was taken. Your Honor, the only objection I have is that um, it's not an original. We don't know who the photographer is. We don't know if it's been Photoshopped. We don't know if it's been altered in any way. 
All right, understood. Response? Um, Your Honor, that's not the foundation for the admissibility. Um, if defense counsel's concerns, they go to the weight, not necessarily the admissibility. This witness has said he is familiar with the person who's in the picture, he's familiar with her Instagram, and he knows whether it's a fair and accurate depiction of Tylee Ryan. All right. I've considered that objection. I think uh, what we have here is a, it, it has been, it will be admitted um, for illustrative purposes in terms of evidentiary value without further foundation about who precisely or when took the picture or where. If we're going beyond that, I'd have concerns so it is admitted for the purpose of demonstrating who is shown in the picture. Thank you, Your Honor. Is the machine on? Thank you. Thank you. Um, is that the picture of Tylee? Yes. Okay. Um, now you indicated that you were aware that um, JJ and Tylee were missing in the fall of 2019, correct? Yes. Okay. Did you ever learn whether JJ and Tylee had been found? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, where were you when you learned that JJ and Tylee had been found? Uh, I was in my parents' home in the garage. Okay. Sorry, just a second. I was in my parents' home in their garage. Okay. All right. Um, and when you became aware of this issue, did you travel somewhere? I did. Um, it was the, the day before my wedding. Um, okay. They weren't certain, so I had my wedding. Okay. And then the next day I came up to Rexburg. Okay, what date was that? Uh, it would have been June 11th. Okay, of what year? Or June. Um, of 2020. Okay. Um, what happened once you got in Rexburg? Um, I, uh, I drove up. Um, I didn't know why, but I just felt like I should come up. And so I came up and uh, I met with Larry and Kay and Woodcock. And, uh, and did law enforcement ask you to do anything? Yes, they uh, they had asked me if I could identify um, JJ. And did you do that? Yes, I did. Um, how did that happen? Um, I, I drove uh, to a place where they showed me some pictures of him and asked if I could identify him, and I did. Okay. Um, and those were images showed you by Rexburg police officers and FBI agents, correct? Yes. Okay. One moment, please, Your Honor. I want to ask you a couple of quick questions to make sure I didn't ask confusing questions. Um, to be clear, what date were you shot at? October 2nd. Of what year? 2019. Okay. And then over the next month or so, you did Google searches? Yes. Okay. Um, and um, uh, do you remember when you uh, saw evidence that um, Tammy Daybell had died? Um. I want to say that I, I saw it on October 21st, maybe. It might have been the 19th. I can't, re I can't say exactly. It's been a few years since then. Okay. I should have reviewed that. I apologize. Sorry. Thank you. I have nothing further. All right. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Mr. Thomas, will you be conducting cross? Yeah, sure. All right, you can do so. Just 
Just, uh, just really quickly, I want to go through, I want to follow up on what uh, Ms. Smith had said. You said on October the 2nd you were shot at, and then over the next few months you did Google searches? Is that what she, you said? Um, over, the, over the next few months there was times I did Google searches, yes. And what were those Google, Google searches about? Um, well, I, the, the one I think she was referring to was I searched for Chad Daybell's name to figure out um, who he was and try to get more information on him. Okay. Um. So you and your then wife, Melanie, uh, were having some issues back in uh, 2018, end of 2018, right? Is that right? Um, d can you define issues? Well, I mean, at some point you got divorced, right? Yeah, but, but in 2018, I, w I wouldn't say that we were at a point where we were looking at divorce. Okay. When did that happen? When did, when did the divorce thing come up? In early 2019? No, not, in, not until June of 2019 was the first time it was ever mentioned. June of 2019. Mm -hmm. And that's when you had gone off to a, uh, a business trip and had come back? No, that was not a business trip. Okay. What was it? We, I took my family and we went to her parents' house. In Arizona? In Utah. Your parents' house? No, my ex's parents live in Utah. Melanie? Melanie's parents live in Utah, and that's where we were staying, was in her parents' home. Oh, I see, I see, okay. Um, and at that point, she said something about uh, she had some, some issues with you, one of them being that she, she said that you, she thought that you were homosexual? Correct. And was that based on, what was that based on? Was there any basis to that? She told me that God had told her. God had told her that you were homosexual? Yes. Okay. It had nothing to do with uh, video that one of your friends had posted on Facebook with you being at the Pink Pony dancing around? Correct. Okay. That was something different? The, the only thing that happened with that was after a long uh, argument. Uh, I asked her to give me some logical reasons because it didn't make any logical sense. And uh, the only thing she could think of was that she had seen a video of me dancing with someone at a Pink Pony club which was available to anybody to see on, on, on Facebook. It was just public. And where, where's the pink pony? Objection, Your Honor. I understand this is cross, but it's getting pretty far afield. Uh, all out at this time, it's proper cross. Uh, it's, it's in Gulf Shores, Alabama. Okay. And then in... Um, as we indicated, October 2nd, you were, you, you believe you were shot at, and you believe that, um, the Jeep that held the gun that was shooting at you was a Jeep Wrangler? Yes. And you believe that that to be Tylee's Jeep Wrangler? Yes, I do. Okay. And you indicated that you had actually tried to, uh, follow that Jeep Wrangler, is that right? For a few seconds, yes. Okay. And did you get the license plate? I was not able to get the license plate. How far away from the Jeep Wrangler were you? Uh, at that point, I was very far away. It was, um, uh, I could bear, I, I barely saw it. It was over at the corner of the neighborhood, and I was um, very far in a distant corner. I just saw the, the Jeep had come around that ag angle, and it turned right around and went the other way. So, so how, how far away was the shot that you think came from, you think it came from the Jeep Wrangler. How far away was the Jeep Wrangler from your car when the shot was made? Um, the, the car was parked probably a little further than the distance of where you're at to me. Me to you? Yeah, a little bit further. 30 feet, 20 feet? Somewhere in there. Okay.
And you indicated that only uh, probably five people knew where you had lived at the time? Yes. And you don't believe this to be a stray bullet or some, some something other than you, you're pretty positive that this came from that Jeep? Yes. Okay. Did you see a muzzle flash from the Jeep? Um, I saw the uh, what looked like, a, as I described before, a silencer. Um, but I can't say that I saw the muzzle flash. And was that in your rear view mirror? No, it was straight in front of me. Straight in front of you? Yeah, I was looking straight at it. Okay. So you saw a silencer, but you didn't see any type of flash when the shot was taken? I can't say for certain that I did. Okay. It's possible that that shot came from somewhere else? No. Okay. You indicated, and I think counsel, uh, counsel for the state and I were both somewhat taken aback when you said that you knew the VIN number of the Jeep and you indicated that you were the uh, insurance agent on the Jeep? I was no longer the insurance agent, um, but I ran it for Charles. He had given me the information. What do you mean by that? Well, he wanted me to price shop, so he gave me the VIN number for each of the vehicles that they had. And when was that? Um, a few months earlier, maybe around April. Okay. And you, he had done that in an email or a text or something like that? Yeah, it was just in my text. Okay. Do you have that text still? Um, I... I'm not. I'm not sure if it was a text or if it was an email. It, honestly, I'm not sure exactly how I got that that VIN, but I know he gave it to me. He may have emailed it. Um, did you? Go ahead. I'm just not. I'm not certain which did, way he gave it to me. Did you turn that information over to the police or to the prosecutor? I did. Yes. That email? Um, no, I I turned over all the the VIN number to the detective at the time. And they didn't ask you how you got the VIN number. Um, I, it was a long time ago. I can't tell you for certain. I just told, just told him the VIN number. Okay. Um, you indicate uh, that you were rereading some emails from Charles to yourself uh, at some point. Did you turn those emails over to the prosecutor or to the police? I did, yes. Okay. And what were those emails about? Um, the emails were uh, from from Charles to the rest of the family. Um, and then some of them were, uh, in, you know, in his concerns about what he thought was going on um, in his relationship with Lori as they went through their breakup. Um, and separately, there were other emails that were um, kind of his evidence that he was giving us of these groups that she was meeting with. I'm, I'm a little bit confused because you indicate that you were rereading emails. I thought, and maybe it was this is me, I thought they were from Charles to you, not to his family. I am part of his family. He sent them to all of us. Okay. So these were group emails that you were a part of the group email? Correct. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. Um, when you found out that uh, they had found... The remains of Tylee and JJ, you indicate that you had a wedding on, looks like, June the 10th, and then you went up to Rexburg on June the 11th, is that right? Yes, I believe it was the 11th. It might have been the 12th. I didn't review my notes on that either, so I should have. Okay. Um, and you indicate that you met with Kay and, and, and Larry Woodcock? I did, yes, that morning. Did you meet with anybody else? Um no, I talked to law enforcement over the phone. Talked to law enforcement over the phone while you were in Rexburg? Yes. Okay. You didn't talk to law enforcement over the phone while you were uh, still in Utah or Arizona or where you were living at the time? Um, are you talking about on that specific day? Yeah. Um, or the day before, or, you know. I can't recall specifically if I met with them. I don't think I did, but I might, I might have met with them in person besides the phone call. I did meet with him in person when I looked at the pictures. Okay. 
And so then you said that law enforcement asked you if you could identify Tylee and JJ? Um, just, just JJ. Just JJ. And so what was that conversation like? I mean, they didn't ask uh, somebody like Kay or Larry or somebody who was closer to JJ? Or they just came to you? I mean, I, th I think I was as close to JJ as Kay and Larry. We were all family. Um, they uh, had initially asked Larry, but um, it's a pretty overwhelming task to do. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if, if it was with his health where it was, if it was something he was up for, so I, I said I would. So you were there when they were having the conversation with Kay and Larry about who was going to identify JJ? I was, I was there after the conversation and talking to them. Oh, okay. All right. You don't have no further questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Will there be any redirect? I, no, Your Honor. All right. That will conclude the testimony of this witness then. Thank you, Mr. Boudreau. Thank you. You can go ahead and step down from the witness box. Your Honor, a uh, quick question. Um, Mr. Boudreau does not leave in this. Mr. Boudreau does not live in this state. Is he released from his subpoena? Any objection? We're not going to recall him. Okay. We don't have any objection. Very well. You can be released from your subpoena as well then. Thank you for appearing and testifying. All right, counsel, at this point, uh, I'm going to suggest we break for the day based on your next uh, witness, who I think is probably going to take some time. Who, who would be called next by the state? Uh, uh, oh, Detective Hermosillo is the next witness for the state to be questioned by uh, Mr. Wood. All right, and do you anticipate that will take some time? Arnold, yes, it will take a, a fair amount of time. Okay. Well, given that and the time frame, I'm going to try to keep committed to our trial schedule for our benefit of the jurors also. So uh, before we break for the day then, um, first I again want to thank everyone for complying with the court's administrative orders and the proceedings and having an orderly first day of trial today. I also know that <clears throat> as jurors, you're probably already tired of hearing me say this, but I'm going to keep telling you every day when you leave, uh, please do not conduct any kind of investigation into this case. Don't look up any information about this case on the Internet or anywhere else. Don't talk to each other or anyone else about the case. If anyone asks you about the case, please tell them you can't talk to them, and if they persist, please report that to the court. We we'll look forward to seeing you all tomorrow morning. You'll be instructed as to when and where to report, and that will adjourn our first day of trial. So with that in mind, uh, we will be in recess until tomorrow. All right, please. All right, we'll be adjourned and we'll start tomorrow at 8.30. Thank you.